All rise, please. Welcome to tonight's council meeting of Tuesday, January the 9th. First order of business will be the singing of Old Canada. I'd like to call forward Isabella Milano. And if you want to come to the mic, Isabella, I'm just going to read a little uh, bio on you. Isabella is 13 years old in grade 8 at Prince Philip School in Niagara Falls. She speaks English, French, and Spanish. She started singing at the age of four. She's a student at the Royal Conservatory of Music and is currently in her sixth year of training. She's won an award for Best Kids Pop Music Video in November of 2016. Isabella plays piano, guitar, and she's a singer and songwriter, so very talented. Isabella uh, gives back to the community through her involvement in the Kiwanis Music Festival, the Niagara Music Festival, the Salvation Army, the Niagara Falls History Museum, the Armory, and many more. So <coughs> Isabella, we'd like to welcome you to the Niagara Falls City Council meeting, and whenever you're ready, you can start singing O Canada. So I want to say that was fantastic. It's a great way to start off the new year. And I want to say thank you very much. Obviously, we're going to be hearing a lot more from you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, first order of business is adoption of the minutes from the December 12, 2017 meeting. Moved by Councilor Morocco, second by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Uh, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Yes, Councilor Peter Angelo. Your Worship, just on the uh, the minutes, I wanted to ask for uh, clarification, if I could. Um, I know what these. I have to pull it up now because it's electronic. Um, so, in the issue that was raised. Um, right at the beginning of the meeting, I think it was, when we were talking about the, the hotel tax. I just got to find it on here, Your Worship. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, I wanted to just clarify what the actual motion is now. Because it says, ordered on the motion of Councillor Crater, seconded by Councillor Morocco, that implementi implementation of the tax be deferred and no action is taken until complete consultation has taken place with all the stakeholders. Um, I guess my question is, does that mean that the approval in principle is still in place? I don't know, our solicitor's not here, he just showed up now. Because all it says here is that the implementation be deferred. Um, no action take place until complete consultation. I would say no, but why don't we get clarification? So, uh, Mr. Beeman, if you all, could help. All I want to make sure is that the issue comes back to this council. 100%. Yeah, that's no all decision, I want to make yeah, sure. 100%. So, no decisions are going to be made until uh, this council <coughs> makes a decision. Can we add those words? Yeah. I mean, wait, you know, absolutely. I'd like to add something there just so that we're reassured that the issue is going to come back to the council before a decision is made. So, so Mr. if you need a motion for that, I'd be happy to Mr. make a motion. Yeah, to Mr. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yep. If, if I may, Mr. Mayor, if you read the, the, the minutes, it was a reconsideration. 
Right. So the old motion would have disappeared, and the new motion that's here is what's in its place. So the motion you see in these minutes is the the motion is the only motion that's still alive, if you will. Okay. You still have the so floor. the previous motion that talked about in principle yeah. under the reconsideration that basically disappears because mm -hmm. the reconsideration replaced it with this. Okay. All I want to make sure is that it's going to come back to this council before we move forward. Then. Conflict, your worship, on this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. We've got two conflicts, Councilor Cario and Thompson. Mm -hmm. Yes. I got Councilor Inoni and then Morocco. Thank you. Uh, upcoming in Mr. Harrison's presentation, it has um, hotel transient tax, and there's a line in there that says um, it will come back after staff meets with the stakeholders and will update council. But I'm I'm sure I speak for all the council when I say we want to be at those meetings. Yeah. So when is the first meeting and what time is it at? It's the 16th, I believe. Uh, is that we right? haven't been told. We got an email from your office the day they could, that the tourism industry confirmed and it was told we would be told when the time is. I thought the date was uh, Yeah, I don't have that. It should so be in your calendar. The should 16th at what time? If you check your calendar, I don't know. It's probably in your calendar. It was put in automatically in everyone's calendars. Yeah, it's at 7 p.m. It's what? I think it's at 7 p.m. Yeah, it's at 7 p.m. Yeah, but just on that, but just on that issue, um, is this, is the city going to make a presentation at that meeting? It's I mean, more of a format. Data. And if we do make a presentation, can we receive it beforehand? There isn't going to be a, it'll be more of a setting the stage how we got here and then looking for uh, feedback from the stakeholders. That's the idea is just to get feedback. Okay. Councilor Rocco? Oh, no, I just wanted to say if there was a motion, I was going to second the motion that if that was the intent to always make it, bring it back to yeah. us. So if there's no motion, that's fine. Okay. So we're good on that one, Councilor? If that's the motion, yeah. If that's the motion, yes. So the first one is, yeah. Um, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. No disclosures? Okay. If, uh, just give me one second here. Hey, just before we get started with our operating budget, and I'll switch chairs here with Councillor Peter Angelo, um, I'm just going to switch things around a little bit today, and I'm going to do the mayor's announcements now, help set the stage for the new year. Is that before anyone leaves in the crowd? That's exactly part of the reason. That's right, because uh, there are a couple of people here, and I wouldn't want them to miss out. Um, starting off with on the on the sad side, obituaries. Uh, Betty Lou Bol Bolis, mother of Lou Bolis in our municipal works department, passed away. She used to uh, be one of the owners of the Minolta Tower and the Secret Garden. Um, uh, also, Dr. <laughs> William Ainsley, who served the community as a medical doctor and a GP for many years in Niagara Falls. And Nic Nicola Vaccaro, brother-in-law of Carmen McNally of our building department, passed away. And lastly, Jack Dennis, a former city employee. So we sent out our condolences to all of the families that have been affected by a loss recently. Like, Yes, Councillor Crater. I hope you don't mind. I, I, I think it's appropriate to mention the name of Ernie Smith, who passed away. Um, Ernie was also on the Bridge Commission uh, for a number of years and was the chair. He was a longtime employee of the federal government of Canada, immigration, very active in the community. So I wanted to bring his name forward. Okay, thank you for that. I'd like to uh, thank Councillor Campbell for representing the city at the Habitat for Humanity Home Dedication Ceremony. Major events, uh, we had Minister Koto here for a middle year's announcement that took place down at the Gale Center. Uh, we had our New Year's Eve event at Niagara Falls. It was very cold. It was bitterly cold. Um, I think it's probably the coldest we've ever had down there. And uh, definitely uh, had an impact on our crowds, but uh, still I will say they were full of uh, excitement. They had a lot of fun. Certainly they dressed for it, but uh, it was a uh, New Year's not like any other. Also, I was joined by councillors Thompson, Campbell, and Crater for the New Year's levy at the Niagara Falls Armory that took place this past Sunday. And as well, uh, recently we had the River of Light Church and the Salvation Army who opened up their doors to people in our community that were looking to eat or sleep or get warm or get whatever care they're looking for. I'd like to thank Councillor Iannone for her uh, involvement in uh, doing that and overseeing that. And yes, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, I was gonna do that under new business, but not only that, I'd like to thank outside of the River of Life and the Salvation Army who were fantastic. Ray Berger and Deb Danson and all of the residents who 
who flooded my emails and my Facebook and my telephone with, we want to bring donations down there. And thanks to the generosity of this entire community, um, we were able to feed people and blanket people and give them clothes and do outreach on trucks and make sure that they got emergency packages if they weren't willing to come in. And they had various reasons as to why they didn't want to come in out of the cold. But I just want to say thank you to those groups. We're looking forward to speaking to them, maybe coming up with something next year that is a rotation so we have something in place. I know the city has an emergency management plan and I was just wondering, when it gets that cold and they start to give out those alerts, Perhaps we could, and I've raised warming centers and cooling centers here many times, but perhaps we can have something that triggers a rotation in the churches, communities, and warming centers, maybe something we could provide for next year. Ne right now, everybody is coming together to say if we have that same spell again, we're already setting them up now in a group outside, so maybe we can have something that's formal next year so that people aren't scrambling. Absolutely, and I know that our uh, acting CEO at the time, uh, Todd Harrison, was working closely with the region to come up with some solutions. And, and I guess it, and it comes down to this, is we, we need to speak with some of our local nonprofit organizations, and they'll have to apply this summer if we want to have these centers up and running. And the region will help fund part of it, but they need to apply in advance. And we didn't have any apply this year, so if we can get them to apply, I spoke, I was at the region today for public health, and they said, we'd be happy to do it if we've got some groups that are willing to take it on. Ms. Councilor? Thank you. And there are groups willing to take it on, and we're coming together to put that together. But I just want to say, while we have the ability to taxi our homeless, and I didn't realize how many we had, taxi our homeless to St. Catharines, homeless have a community too. They have their own network, their own um, news line. It's not a telephone, it's not the internet, but they seem to have a network so they knew where we were. Um, when we send them to St. Catharines, the challenge is while they are homeless, this is still their community and their network of friends and, and supporters are here and it's coming back here that becomes the challenge for them. So we really need to find something that's in Niagara Falls proper and we're not farming it out. So. You know, and if I could also add to that, um, when I, the, the other thing they said to me today at Public Health was that um, their goal is to help the homeless people get permanent housing. And they said sometimes it takes us extreme cold till they will come in and they can actually talk to them and try to place them. And they said it's a good opportunity for us to reach out to some of these people that <coughs> need help. And they said, and we do have, uh, they were, she was also explaining to me that in Niagara Falls, we currently do have a place for women, place for families, and for um, um, men under 30. Uh, we currently have places. It's for men over 30 that don't have a place. And, and she said, yeah, I've got you. And uh, she said the, the good thing about having an organized pre-planned center is they have the right regional staff that will get to them with social services. And if it's a mental health issue, it's, if it's an addiction issue, if it's a, whatever the issue, they've got the staff that can come in and help them. And she said, our goal is we don't want people living in these centers. We want to get them into affordable housing. She says a lot of time we don't know who they are. We can't reach them. They're wherever they are. And anyway, that was the upside to the downside is they were able to reach some of these people. Yes, Councilor. Uh, there's a public meeting tomorrow night at the St. Catharines Library at 8 o'clock with various agencies dealing with the homeless issue in the last couple weeks in the cold spell. So I'll be <laughs> attending that. And anybody who wants to go, it's open for the public. Okay, thank you for that. Any, um, and so also moving along, a uh, reason to celebrate is the World Junior Hockey Canadian hockey team won gold this year. So it was a great vindication from last year. Uh, and the last thing I want to say, we'll wait till we got everybody here because this is for all of us. This is, it's a new year and we're hoping that we're going to be able to take a renewed approach. Uh, 2017 was a challenging year for this council and throughout the region. I can tell you at the region, there were council problems. At other municipalities, they've had challenges. And obviously with us as well, there's been challenges. So what we're hoping now is this year, if we can all come together and focus on who put us here and why they put us here. The example I like to use is the prime directive, uh, which for us is the strategic initiatives that we all agreed to three years ago. Uh, even some before that, seven years ago, where we decided we did a SWOT analysis on the city, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats. And we decided collectively what we were going to do to address all of these situations to move the city forward. And I think overall we'd agree it's been very productive. We've had major announcements from the GO train, hospitals, 
theaters. We've had a lot of great things come forward, and hopefully there's gonna be a lot more great things coming forward. But I'll tell you, it's best if, you know, we say we don't have to worry about getting beat by another municipality. We're gonna beat ourselves, the path that we've been on. So I think it's incumbent upon us, the people expect us to look past our personal differences, look past the past. We've got 11 meetings, including tonight, so 10 after tonight, and that's it. And then we're gonna enter the election. So I think it'd be nice if we did it in a more peaceful way. And I'd also like to thank Councillor Cario for his suggestion of getting on a, on a kinder, more productive path for 2018. We had, we had lunch on the weekend and we talked about it and, uh, and I've spoken with uh, all of council about the ideas of moving forward in a productive way. And I think we're all on the same page, that's our goal. That's what people at home expect us to do. And they expect us to, to follow through on why we were elected and it was for the city business. So uh, our next meeting is gonna be January the 23rd. And as I say, there's only 10 more to go and this year is gonna be done. So at this point, I'd call Councillor Peter Angelo. Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo, did you want to speak? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I wanted to add um, uh, a letter of condolence to the family of uh, Michael and Carla Allen. Um, oh, yeah. Carla yeah. passed away. She was <coughs> 48 years old. Um, I know she was sick for a lot of years. Um, Michael, I think everyone in this room probably would know because he's Michael presented Allen. to us yeah. as an architect uh, many times on, on behalf of different developers. So. We could send her a letter. Hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I sent that yesterday, Councillor. So thank you for that. Uh, it was real sad to read about uh, her leaving her son and her two little kids behind. And uh, she was a wonderful lady. And we definitely will. Uh, and visitation is tomorrow at Morrison Son. Uh, it's uh, two to four, I believe, and seven till nine. And I'm sure it's going to be pretty busy. So I will now switch seats with Councillor Peter Angelo, who's now going to lead us through our budget session as we go through the operating budget. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, back in December, Council had passed the capital budget, and I know the Director of Finance wanted to introduce the operating budget and just get some feedback from Council tonight. Uh, the presentation was already sent out electronically, but I know that Mr. Harrison wants to go through it for us. So, Mr. Harrison, I pass it over to you. Um, before I get started, uh, Mr. Budget Chair, I just wanted to add something to um, the undertakings of last week. Um, I think uh, one of the things I'd like to thank is, uh, I'm not sure if Councilor Iannone said it, I wasn't, I didn't hear, but uh, Salvation Army actually opened up a, 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 an overnight emergency shelter for four of the nights as well during the, the time. So I just wanted to, if I'm, if I'm doubling uh, Councilor Iannone's uh, thanks, uh, <coughs> I'd like to, I apologize for that, but I didn't hear that. Uh, the other thing is I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, since Ken was away, I was filling in for him, and I want to acknowledge some of the, all of our staff, uh, the transit staff, um, the, the, the people that were working at night, um, our fire department, as well as the police who all had uh, undertaking and in, in, in taking the initiatives to assist people uh, to get to the warming centers or to get to the emergency centers. So I just want to take that chance. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if the uh, memo didn't get out to the public about coming tonight, but. It seems like uh, we all stayed home. Uh, Councillor Carrier will be happy to know I've got two presentations tonight. So maybe we want to go on the first one, Mr. Uh, Clerk, please. Go back. There's one on the budget engagement process. It's a different presentation. <coughs> so I quickly want to talk about um, this. Uh, this was new this year that we undertook uh, to go out to the public. You've seen this guy, he's been in a number of our different uh, videos. Um, anyways, uh, we went out to the public, we had a video that we played at council, and we had it on, online. Um, the, on our Let's Talk page, there was 802 visitors to the page. Um, 
we had surveys available and we did some pop-up engagements uh, on um, at four centers. The next thing is we ran on Facebook and Instagram, we ran an ad from throughout November and uh, we re uh, reached just under 15,000 people. Uh, 590, just under 600 links were uh, clicked and it was uh, about the pop-up en en engagements. The uh, YouTube video, um, YouTube video, sorry, uh, was, uh, was on the website. Um, and then we did uh, ads in the newspaper that ran throughout November about the engagements in the online survey. The engagements were, uh, were held at the library, the Gale Center, the McBain Center, and Coronation Center throughout um, different times of the day. And we had, uh, you know, <coughs> it was, we had some interesting <coughs> conversations with some of the people in the public. Um, wasn't uh, overwhelmingly attended, but it was uh, interesting for the people that did show up. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend all four. Uh, some of my other staff attended as well. It was a good opportunity to speak to some of the <laughs> citizens. Um, there's just to kind of give you what we had asked on the survey, um, you know, these questions. And in, in your handouts are some of the written responses. I, I didn't put it in the presentation because some of the wording maybe would be, I think it's important that you see it because it's from the residents, but it's probably not for the presentation. Um, but I didn't want to extract uh, comments. But, uh, you know, we asked people how familiar they are with the budget. To, and again, you, you have to recognize the fact that this is not representative sample of the entire population, but it was those that participated. And uh, that question, you can see that some people were very familiar, but the majority of were somewhat otherwise uh, familiar. Um, we asked about, this is always something that comes up, you know, what's the annual tax increase that you would uh, we, you would support, and again, we gave different uh, op options, and the, the 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 details are here. It's interesting to note that, uh, you know, of of that population, 67% said that a zero tax increase would not be something they would support. And again, this is not a, it's not a uh, scientific uh, poll. If you uh, chose to increase a tax increase, uh, where would you? Uh, like the money spent and again the roads were an area that were identified I think that's one of the things that we hear <coughs> on an ongoing basis that the infrastructure the hard infrastructure is where the money should be spent um, again uh, there, if a zero tax increase were to uh, agree to where would you go and these are some of the examples and so you know the next one is indicate the importance of it of the services that the city has. Again, infrastructure tends to be the, the most important service in, in this very, very limited sample size. And uh, it's interesting for the approximately, it was between 70 and 100 people. I didn't really have the clicker there, but that's what we had. The OLG gaming, uh, despite the fact that we report on it at least twice a year, uh, I speak about it in all the budgets continues to be somewhat where people are mystified where we spend the money and so uh, we had charts and we had uh, um, we had put up uh, some visual effects for people and again uh, this was a very very important uh, conversation that most of the people had with me and uh, you know once you explain where we where we spend the money they had an understanding of what we're doing with it and it was useful in that regard uh, user fees and this is the discussion on user fees and and uh, talk about <coughs> infrastructure, uh, infrastructure renewal and debt, and again. So those are the samples that I, I flipped quickly through the charts. I don't want to dispel any of it, but again, the sample size isn't significant enough really to put a lot of credence in it. All of you uh, have your interactions with the public and you certainly would have an understanding of where the direction goes, but it was a first step. Uh, we had tried some bu budget engagement previ in previous years we restarted it again, and uh, we'll continue to move forward with this in future budgets. But I thought I'd share the information with you. 
So I think we're through the uh, presentation. If you want to go to the main presentation. So as we talked about, uh, we've already approved the capital budget. Uh, there will be an, uh, an amendment to the capital budget which will be done in May when we have the final uh, numbers come in from the uh, last two payments of the OLG funding and uh, some of those things that were addressed on as we like to call it tab 10 will be addressed at that time. Um, tonight's presentation is really to go through the operating budget. You know, the operating budget staff starts in September working on it uh, and then we had it in a position where we got it out to council in December electronically and gave you the holidays to kind of go through it. Uh, but tonight is really for me to kind of uh, go through and highlight the key, key factors and, get, and receive your feedback and get some direction as we move forward. Um, the parking and the utility budgets, we're planning on doing the similar thing in th on the 13th of February. Although I'd love to see you approve the budget, I'm not, I don't think tonight would be the night to approve the budget as we've not really had a lot of uh, discourse. So the budget, uh, the budget has uh, been put together, uh, focusing on our core service levels that was established uh, at the beginning of the council term. And it's identified with strictly the council's priorities. You can see that there's been enhanced services that are tied to the strategic priorities. This includes uh, the anticipated fire contract. Uh, we've, we've been negotiating with the fire, uh, Professional <coughs> Firefighters Association and it's gone to arbitration and we anticipate that the, the uh, their award will be in the first couple of months. And so this budget reflects that full cost, our anticipated cost. Um, there's an enhanced uh, preventative maintenance programs and we'll get into more details of that. Uh, one of the things that council has initiated at the beginning of the term was enhancements to our transit service and that's included in this and as well as there's been some additional resources allocated to the streets and parks maintenance for some of the capital improvements that we've done. So it's included some new staffing which we'll talk about um, and identify some of the revenue uh, reductions that we've had. We've had the ongoing Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund being reduced. It shows that there's strong assessment growth at the end of 2017, which has really positively uh, impacted the budget, as well as uh, a continuation with another priority of this council is to reduce the debt on a, uh, on a year by year basis and thereby reduce the uh, debt servicing charges. If you look at the next chart, you can see that uh, the expenditures uh, in gross have, have increased by 3.14%, um, uh, primarily in the salary and wages uh, category is the largest area, and as I indicated, that is the uh, cumulative uh, impact of the uh, FIRE uh, award. As you know, uh, the way we uh, do it is that we uh, set up a provision in the HR area for negotiations annually as to what we expect. And then when we would settle the agreement or when we would know what the ramifications are, we would uh, then uh, adjust the provisions within the department. And that's what we've done here. Um, there's been, as I indicated, some additional staff. Uh, we've had the annual increases of the other bargaining groups as well as the, um, some progressions for newer staff through the, their salary grids. Um, it's been reflected as well, uh, the employee benefits are a factor of the s salaries and wages and it's gone up. There's been a slight increase in some of the uh, uh, benefit provisions, but it's, uh, that adjustment is made pretty well mirrors the salaries. You can see that there's been a, a reduction of about $480,000 in debt charges, both the repayment of the principal and the interest. This, this shows, uh, this is a, what we were indicating with the, re, the continuation of the debt reduction plan. The other expenses are inflationary in nature. The rents and financials has gone, it's a smaller category, it's gone up. And primarily, uh, this is an increase in our, in our uh, small business office across the street, which is a provincial funded program, and the entire uh, offset of the increase has been offset with uh, a grant. So although the expense gone up, there's been a corresponding grant increase. And um, 
we have an increase in the uh, internal transfers again, uh, which is just a reflection of our internal billing charges among for our fleet. So the next chart kind of highlights a few things, and I don't want to repeat myself, but I'll try to keep going through this. Uh, new positions that are included are consistent with the strategic priorities and council direction. One of the things is that the uh, the federal government uh, eliminated the uh, tax-free component to the council and mayor salaries, and so for 2018, uh, we've included that. Uh, so that's had an, a bit of an increase because you, uh, one third of each of everyone's salaries is now fully taxable. Um, that's basically a transfer from the federal government because uh, they want that be, to be taxed. Um, just on that point. On that point? Yeah. 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 Council creator. Yeah. I, because people are watching, I just want to make it clear that the council never got an increase in salary because of this. All you did was adjust it, so our salary stays the same. Am yeah, I correct. Yes or no? no? Yeah. Thank you no. very much. Thank you. Well, I'd like to elaborate if I could. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I mean, the uh, it, the one third we've made it whole. That was the decision the council made was to make it whole. So the the gross number went up, but it's basically to pay the tax that you would pay on that one third. The debt issuance, uh, the only debt issue that we made last year was at the library, and that was for a, a HVAC replacement at the, at the library as part of our energy program. And uh, that was the only one that we did, so it partially offset some of the reductions um, that, that, was, that, were, that were made in the, uh, in the debt servicing. I've talked about the fire negotiations. One of the other thing is the multi-year transit improvements. We've had additional hours on the bus. Uh, Mr. Dranzari <coughs> can talk about it, but basically we've, we've expanded the peak hour service um, in, in the transit area. But we've had increased infrastructure costs. We've had a number of uh, uh, consultants come in last year during the area. Everybody jokes that tonight's budget night, but actually budget night is all, all of the council meetings because we get, council gets faced with decisions that have to be made. We've had uh, a couple of consultants uh, come in indicating about uh, the need to take, initiate new programs or new initiatives <laughs> to uh, alleviate our infrastructure concerns. And as a result, there has been some extra spending in, in road repairs and then an additional staff person, as I talked about, in the infrastructure area. The uh, municipal election is... Uh, it happens every four years and it's uh, funded uh, from reserves but it's included in so it impacts the expenses obviously as I talked about there's some additional summer and seasonal staff in various departments uh, this is through co-op students or other students that are in their uh, areas as well as a new crew in the uh, uh, new summer crew a temporary crew for the uh, new uh, turf field that we have that we installed this fall this is an ongoing problem that we have, it, and this is a good good news story, but because it, it shows that we're upgrading our information systems, but with that comes increased licensing costs, and that's in, uh, impacted in the information systems area. A positive uh, note is that the investment that we had two years ago to replace the street lighting and put in LED lights has had a positive impact with a five, five, approximately 5% five reduction in that cost. We've, had a, we've seen a slight increase in the pool goss as we've added additional hours based on our, our needs in the last couple of summers where we've opened pools uh, for the extending heat. And so we built that into the budget. Um, the armory building we inherited from the federal government a few years ago and the expenses were carried under the museum. We've, we've reevaluated what our actual operating costs are and uh, split it from the museum. So you'll see that as a separate uh, uh, responsibility center and it added about $20,000 to the cost. <coughs> uh, one of the other council of, uh, initiatives was to uh, continue to expand the, the cultural services and, and expenses in this. And uh, uh, Ms. Moldenhauer has included in the budget art in public spaces. And that's about $20,000 that we've added this year. That's been something that's new. From a staffing standpoint, uh, uh, when the CAO came here, he implemented a attrition program where we looked at uh, people that are retiring or leaving the organization, evaluating the position 
is we have a number of positions that uh, staff have identified that we need to uh, replace. Uh, however, we're not able to add all those new positions. Uh, so we've looked, we've developed this attrition program. And the, attrition, the attrition program assists uh, staff in adapting, re realigning uh, resources. And this has been ongoing. Um, as came at one of the other budget meetings throughout the year, uh, our insurance premium uh, it went down uh, in, in 2017. And as it is an annual program, it goes into 18 and is resulted in a reduction in insurance costs. We've had slight increases in fee for services for uh, the chair of Ann. I talked slightly about the Niagara Falls Library. Although it's not a fee for service, it's an independent group. I've lumped it in for the presentation here. The uh, library, we can talk more about that when we get to that chart. And the Humane Society is, uh, like most of the fee for service groups, we've held the line. We haven't increased their spending for a number of years. Humane Society is, is, uh, re has requested an increase and we've included an amount in there that we'll talk about later in the presentation. This is a chart that I know uh, the chair of the budget committee particularly likes and this is I think something that council has initiated and you can see that at the beginning of the term the de debt was at $62 million. At the end of the term, at the end of uh, 2018, it'll be $48 million. It'll be a, re a reduction of $22.6 uh, million. Um, and we have borrowed through the time, but we just have not borrowed uh, above uh, what we, is retiring. You can see that the uh, annual debt uh, charges that we have has also reduced by $2.1 million in that period of time, which is a 26.8 uh, percent reduction and right now there's no uh, there's no borrowing planned in 2018 now that money once uh, once we don't have to pay off the debt anymore that just gets added to the operating budget yeah so, I mean, it, so the the expenditure increase is 3.14 but it's truly a little bit higher because we have the four hundred thousand dollars that we're not paying uh, in debt servicing charges. exactly so it allows us to do other things with the funds correct Um, so you can see the, the next chart uh, by department uh, where the operating expenses are. And it might be, I think this is symbolic in the sense that you can see that uh, where the departments that uh, are contributing to the higher area as we talked about. Um, it's a little bit misleading. You can look at municipal works and I did talk about adding some staff in that area and adding uh, expenses but they're you know, we also have debt that's retired, and the way the debt is, it's re it's it's sourced to the uh, uh, the responsibility center, so that's why that number would be low. Same thing with recreation. Okay. The new positions on the next chart. The new positions that are talked about. I did talk about this. Uh, the additional bus operators that are needed to cover those additional hours that we talked about. And that comes out of the council priorities and the initiatives that were passed a few years in the goal in the term. Uh, in municipal works park maintenance, we have two seasonal employees that are going to be designated for the turf fields. Um, and that again is to maintain the, the infrastructure that we put in place. We were fortunate enough to partner with uh, a, a service provider, the school board, uh, and a community group and ourselves to build uh, a nice new uh, sports field that can be used by a number of uh, residents, um, but we need to look after it properly and we've added staff accordingly. Uh, as I indicated, we have a supervisor of infrastructure that's going to address a lot of the issues that have been raised by consultants, addressing drainage and uh, various other things that we talked about, the roads condition and giving us better information to make better decisions. And municipal enforcement, there's an additional bylaw officer that was added at the end of last year that we had the budget for this year. And this is uh, related to the addressing a, an increasing number of bylaw issues, including the A, B, and Bs, um, and various things like that. It's important to note that there have been other positions that were asked for by departments, but have not been included. And uh, although uh, it's difficult to, you know, at the bottom line, people want us to maintain the, the tax uh, position that we were, were resulting in. This uh, chart is just a reminder. This was in, in Municipal Works last year. 
Uh, it talks about 17's uh, increase. If you remember, we put a seasonal crew on. Uh, that's included into the uh, annual cost. And then we've added a couple other people, as they talked about, with seasonal, uh, with the turf field. But you can see the growth impacts over the term of the council. And you can see the, the staffing considerations that we've had to take into account. Climate change is one of those ones that we continue to address. It's a silent there, <coughs> whether it's more rain or whether it's uh, <coughs> up, uh, hot and cold that we are experiencing and the impact it has on our roads. This was raised. I put this chart in. The next chart is the transient accommodation tax or the known as the hotel tax. I put this chart in because I want to be clear that although uh, we're discussing it with the industry and getting public input and council is going to provide, have the opportunity to make the final decision, it will not have an impact on the 2018 budget. This is not something that is going to, none of the adjustments, uh, this will be a year of transition and it won't have any impact on the budget. And while the line, the second line says staff will be holding meetings, <coughs> their public meetings that staff will be attending. The next chart, uh, uh, so I broke down, Carl had asked me to put this in as a reminder of what the impact of adding these additional hours are. And so this is a chart that's been there before. It shows the ridership increase that has occurred uh, in, the, in the city uh, on our system as we've added uh, more services. You can see that it's a fairly significant, it's almost a, it's a little bit over a 40% uh, gross income uh, increase from the from 2014 to 2017, and we anticipate that 2018 would continue to have increases. This next uh, chart is, uh, as you recall, we we have all of the service boards and the fee for services. They are uh, regul not regulated, but managed by the individual departments. The departments are shown uh, in one of the columns. And um, you can see that uh, for the most part, most of the area agencies have not had an increase, um, despite the fact that they, they would like one. Um, we haven't uh, got into those. Um, we do have some increases. As I talked about the Animal Control Service or Niagara Falls uh, Humane Society, uh, they've experienced some increase in costs that they've been able to incorporate in their business the last number of years, but this year they've indicated that uh, those costs they can't be raised in fundraising or additional uh, fees, dog licenses, et cetera, like that. And we've added $50,000 to that fee this year. Uh, there may be other discussions that we have during the year and get back to council on that. Uh, Chair of Van, again, this is based on the services that are provided. Ridership is anticipated to go up again. Uh, and we've seen a significant increase in the Chair of Van ridership since uh, the relocation of dialysis in the city here. Um, the Niagara Falls Library Board uh, is indicating that they've had some increases in labor costs and they've repositioned some of the staffing uh, in, the, in the department and then they've had the same staff impact that we've, uh, the staff increase that the city's experienced with the, uh, for the QP uh, group. Um, but they've been responsible and reduced uh, and offset some of these save some of these costs with savings, um, particularly in the hydro area. <coughs> so the next chart, we now turn to revenues, and uh, so we had a 3.14 percent increase in the uh, operating expenses. Um, we we've also had an increase in in the revenues and. Primarily, the biggest area is in the taxation. This isn't new taxes, this is growth. Um, it is over 2% uh, for the year. That is a significant uh, in increase. That's the net growth. So last year at this time, I, I stood before you and said that I was concerned that we had a significant number of appeals and assessment, and that would have a negative impact. And while that did, we did have some assessment losses. We also found that we had assessment growth, real growth, not valuation growth, not going through the four-year inc incremental uh, in the valuation increases. These are real growth. This is new growth. And as a result, uh, it has a positive impact on, on our operating budget and as to what we have to actually come up with. 
Uh, most of the other areas have not had a huge impact. Uh, the waste management fee has gone down slightly. The region was able to uh, reduce the, the fees marginally, and that's what we're seeing there. Um, the majority of these fee increases in other municipalities are within um, within inflation. The service <coughs> charges, user fees, concession, these are volume uh, increases, particularly in the transit area, like I talked about, there's an increase. Also in the building department, where we've seen those things that talk about the, the, the assessment growth, we've seen some building permit fees increase, so we've adjusted there. Um, the investment income, well, we've, uh, because we've received this OLG money, we've had higher than expected cash balances as we get the lag from getting the money in to spending the money, and we've been able to uh, increase our investment and also changing our portfolio around <coughs> within the, the limits of the municipal act. The internal transfers are uh, related to uh, real, re the internal transfers are related to the charges for our fleet uh, uh, within the area within in the department with just an internal charge and the reserve funds increase is just the reserve fund increase that I said the expenses for the election went up by two hundred fifty thousand dollars and we had reserves for that uh, for that uh, event so the next chart is where does the tax growth come from and you can see that uh, we have a continuation of, uh, of growth in the commercial sector which is about 20 20 percent um, that came on board and then on the residential uh, side is about 80% uh, we're down in both the industrial and in multi-residential these are these are reductions in those areas and they t that touches to what I was saying about the ARB uh, hearings and, and assessment losses but overall we're up over 2% the next chart kind of reiterates what I've said already. The assessment growth is over $1.3 million. The growth in assessment is negatively offset by the uh, assessment appeals. Uh, this is where the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund, if you recall back when we were at the height of our bargaining, we were over $2.6 million. This year we're at under $900,000 and it was another $180,000 we, we were reduced this year. Uh, when I say user fee growth, we're talking about uh, in the recreation areas, we're not seeing a lot of growth in those areas. We are seeing some growth, as I talked about, in the building permits, planning areas, committee of adjustments, all uh, related to development, and uh, a small uh, forecast in transit. The Provincial Offenses Act, uh, POA fees, these are collected by the region and shared amongst the municipalities, continues to go down, and we ent we've adjusted the budget for to reflect that. Um, this is a this is a good news bad news story. I, I, this is a really good news story for my staff. Uh, we've been able to reduce the outstanding tax arrears. Uh, we were just able to close the tax uh, cutoff uh, for the end of the year, and we're at the lowest that we've been in in, in the last uh, six to seven years. Uh, actually, I don't recall in my time that we were this low. You know, the problem with that is that we don't collect as much in penalties, and as you know, we're, the penalties are, are built into the uh, budget. So uh, that's a good news story uh, for people out there that they're keeping up on their taxes and not finding themselves in arrears. Assessment appeals, just real quickly, I'd like to talk about this. We're in the second year of the reassessment cycle. As you know, all the values are based on a, <coughs> all the values are based on a 26 January 1st, 2016 number, and it goes through the four years. And so we're in the second year of that. We still have ex uh, significant exposure to appeals, uh, despite the fact that the ARB has uh, found ways to expedite these hearings. Uh, some of the municipalities, particularly Niagara Falls, we are in a position where we uh, have a number of uh, long-term appeals that are still being held, uh, conducted under the courts. And so we have uh, established an allowance for, uh, for, seven, uh, for these appeals. And it was established in 17 and continues for this year. I think I've talked about the growth, growth enough. So here we go, after going through the revenues and the expenses, we're now at a point where we can talk about what our difference is. Our difference is just under $1.6 million. 
which re represents a 2.62 net levy increase if we were to stop here today. Um, I think some people had talked about other municipalities and so we did a quick uh, survey this week of what other municipalities and we have, uh, there's only two municipalities that maybe three, I'm, I'm reading the information that was prepared, but St. Catharines is, is come in with a levy increase of 1.67 and uh, uh, Welland has come in with a, a, a uh, increase of 2.62 and Lincoln has come in with a increase of 5.6%. The other municipalities are all in the state of going through their budgets. So that gives you a little bit of, of a background of what's going on in the rest of the municipalities. The region came in at 2% net, net after growth. Okay, I think before we uh, finalize or have any discussion, there's a few other things that are sitting in there. We put this chart in the last couple of years so that council is aware of these future things that haven't been resolved yet that are gonna have a budget impact. Um, and uh, again, the continuation of transit enhancements. I know that uh, Mr. Dren had, has put in front of council that there's each and every year there's a continual enhancement to the transit. This is gonna continue through uh, through the 19 and, and through the next term of council. The fire settlement, I talked about that, but that's better, <coughs> but actually station seven staffing of the, at the new location, there's gonna be a report back or sometime in the first half of the year that we'll, we'll be dealing with on that and what, what impacts that'll have on future budgets. A continuation of the council strategic priorities, obviously with, with a new term of council next year, uh, that council will come in with new strategic priorities. Um, uh, however, those will likely lead to uh, additional pressures on, on the expenditure side. Uh, despite the fact that there's a provincial election this year, I don't see that the provincial government is gonna change much as they it continue to increase the reductions in the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund. The area that we receive the money in will continue to be withdrawn uh, on a gradual basis. And uh, so that will be a, 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 a risk for us as we move forward. Reassessment and tax appeals continue to be uh, something. Uh, you know, our commercial sector is approximately 27% of our overall assessment base. That's a significant, for a community our size, that's a significant uh, exposure to assessment appeals. Usually uh, uh, professional uh, assessment uh, agents are more likely to deal with uh, commercial uh, property owners as opposed, and we have to be aware that those things are, th are, are there and that we are exposed to certain types of appeals and all the various problems that may exist in, in the valuations. This is an important thing to understand. I've been uh, beating this drum the last three years. Um, the asset, asset management reporting is getting more and more in depth, whether it's the gas tax reporting, whether it's the OCIF, whether it's the CWWF, whether it's PTIF, or what other, other acronyms at the upper levels of government come through. The reporting is, is, is becoming more stringent and requires us to meet uh, the needs of our asset management plan. That's going to happen. So the takeaways. The net expenditures are an increase of 3.14. We've included new positions based on the direction the council's provided, both in increased services as well as uh, strategic priorities. We have a slight reduction. We have a, a reduction in the debt servicing co cost, which has slightly reduced the net spending trick. So asset growth has been included and is in good shape. We are exposed to assessment appeals, and we are seeing very minimal growth in revenues from other fees. So that ends my, I, nobody's <laughs> left. The gallery stayed the same. So I will, uh, I, I will end it right now and say that I'm looking for a discussion or any direction that, or questions that council may have. Sure, anyone have any questions of Mr. Harrison? Councilor Cario. just wants to stop while everybody's still awake. Um, could you it's tell early me in the night. The, um, how much, what's the, the amount of money that we're gonna get from the uh, Provincial Tourism Fund this year? The, I mean the OLG fund. What, what, how much are we gonna get for, from the OLG this year? Well, it's, it's difficult to say because we, we're, we're up about a million dollars, so 
if that trend continued. Uh, last year we were at 24, 24 seven. So I would say we'd be up over $25 million uh, for, because we were trending, we were about a million dollars ahead after two quarters. So that, that's before we give the police their yeah. yeah. So, so the chart that's before, not there, before. the chart that's not there that maybe I should have put in is of that money, we, we commit $10 million to the operating budget. We commit $6 million to the uh, to the tax levy subsidization, which uh, we've had. And then we commit $4.2 million to the police uh, group. As you can see on February 13th, we're bringing back the uh, consultant's report to talk about the OLG uh, policing. I, I kind of wanted to talk about that as well. Um, I don't know if uh, our acting clerk would be able to pull back up the budget engagement results, but I wanted to go to question six because that one dealt with the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. And it talked about what the public really wanted to see us do with the funds. And I'll just wait until he actually gets there because there was five choices that were there. Uh, community groups, infrastructure, tax subsidy, economic development, and uh, the new hospital. And if we actually look at the results, I think there they are there. Um, the first two really should be added together because it's very important and somewhat important. So those are the ones that are important to the people. And so if you look at the blue and the red, you can see that municipal infrastructure and the future hospital development really rank. They're actually, they're tied. 155 uh, for both one or for both of them and then the other items that would take the third and fourth spot would be property tax subsidy and economic development. Uh, Councilor Cario asked how much we get per year and I think this is our fourth year now or we're nearing completion of our fourth year for the new agreement with OLG. So in round figures I think the city would have collected around 100 million dollars over the last four years. Of that, I believe that we've committed 24 million, almost one quarter of it, to tax subsidy. 16 million has been sent to the region for police services. And the other 60 million, I'll let maybe Mr. Harrison just elaborate. I mean, I think it's important to tell the public how we spend that money and what the breakdown is. Most of it, I believe, has gone to infrastructure, but I'll let you elaborate on it. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the majority of the money has gone to uh, infrastructure, and then that's been one of the reasons why we've been able to lower our debt borrowing, because as we indicated when we did the initial <coughs> asset management plan, we have a, like all municipalities, we, we have more infrastructure that we need to replace than the monies uh, to do that. And so the majority of the, the funding that we spent is, and that's part of the reporting, it's just not here right now, uh, but the majority of the funding goes to uh, it goes to uh, infrastructure uh, infrastructure renewal. Uh, we've been able to use a lot of that infrastructure renewal on things that otherwise wouldn't get done. Um, you know, the water and sewer budget and the, and the, the allocation from the uh, operating budget cover the main core uh, services. Uh, you know, the water and sewer cover the infrastructure that we have, although, you know, depending on the information that you believe, uh, we would we're still under 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 serviced in that area, underfunded in that area, and so the other things that we've been able to do is to utilize some of that for park renewal. We've had some infrastructure renewal where we uh, we have a couple of major streetscaping projects that have been funded through there. Um, we've had fleet replacement that we you know we've been able to add to the fleet that we haven't been able to do. So those are those are the things that we do. Okay. I, I think the important message that I wanted to send is that um, our priorities are aligned with what the public's priorities are because those are the same choices that we've made when we've decided what to do with the money. And you talked about deficit. I'll go on that one in a second, but I also have a couple people that had their hand up, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Ainoni. Well, I think uh, the OLG report is coming back for the police. Mm -hmm. What's the date? The 13th, February 13th. Councilor Anoni? Have we pre spent any of our 2018 money already? <clears throat> yes. How much? Uh, and on what? Pardon? How much and on what? It was in the capital budget. It was approved in the capital budget. And it was approximately, I'd have to, I'd have to call it up. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, obviously, the 
uh, it was I'm trying to think. I'd have to I'd have to look. I don't have that information. We brought that was fully disclosed in the capital budget discussion. I wasn't here. That's why. No, I know, but I can I can provide that for you, Councillor. But Thank you. I just don't have it right in front of me right now. I mean, it was to fund uh, capital projects that otherwise you know, we move forward. One of the reasons that we did it like this is that we know that the capital budget we staff have been faced with some comments from council to get the capital budget out sooner than later to get better prices and so we went forward with it we know because this is the fourth year of the olg we also know because we're a million dollars ahead that we could go ahead and comfortably uh, allocate some of the funding to projects uh, so that they can move forward and, and and get started and that staff can go forward with it so those are those are some of the reasons but i can certainly give you the information when i get back to you know i can send Councilor Kerry. Just a, just a couple of comments along the lines of what you were asking, Mr. Chairman. The, um, obviously the risks, depending on the percentages that you put in toward the operating budget and infrastructure, if you put it all towards infrastructure and it stops, uh, we have to do less infrastructure work. But if you put it toward the operating budget, what, what did you say that we put into the operating budget? What percentage? Right now, uh, well, one quarter of the money that we receive goes to tax subsidy. It's six million dollars a year that we put into the operating budget. Which, from if the wasn't there, would represent an increase <coughs> of thirteen percent. Well, uh, the annual uh, because we've had the increase in growth, I've always used five hundred fifty thousand dollars would represent one percent. One point. One, one point. It's now closer to six sixty. So. Six six hundred and sixty thousand dollars would represent nine one, to ten one percent. Per point. So 10%, so it would be 9 10, ten. It would be a ten percent. Ten percent. Nine nine point five. That, if ten that percent. Went away. Yeah. So in the future, we'd have to take that into consideration. We're trying not to be as dependent on using that money in our operating budget. So if through the new yeah. modernization or whatever, our revenues suddenly decrease, <coughs> we don't have the taxpayers facing a large uh, increase because that money's not there. Yeah. That's right. <coughs> Anyone else have any questions of Mr. Harrison? Mr. Mayor? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and the part that really jumps out at me that I'm really happy to see is I know we're doing record amounts of infrastructure investment, but at the same time, bringing down our debt. Our debt, yeah. And I think that is really the panacea kind of approach that, that people would love to see, to see that we're fixing up more roads, more sewers, uh, more sidewalks, but at the same end, parks and trails, which I saw was number three, uh, right after roads, sewers, uh, water, uh, came trails on the one survey uh, that we're doing record trails and parks and at the same time bringing down our debt. We've got a beautiful Gale Center four pad. We've got the McBain Center. We've got some nice, very nice facilities, newer facilities. So I think we're in a real enviable position and it's great. And there's no question it's because of the OLG money that we've been fortunate enough to negotiate from three million a year to significantly more. And you know we don't know how long this lasts. We don't know what changes are gonna happen in the market with modernization. We don't know what's gonna happen, but right now it's definitely saved us years of finances and keeping the dollars down. So I just wanna say I'm glad that um, our director of finances has heard us when we said about keeping an eye on the debt because I think that's the thing a lot of people really keep an eye on that that keeps going down. And I know, can you, maybe through you, Mr. Chair, could we have the um, Director of Finance comment on what our self-imposed uh, debt ceiling is, what the provincial debt ceiling is, and where we set as our debt as a portion of our, uh, of our operating budget? Okay, so the, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, through to you, to the Mayor. Uh, the, the province has a, uh, a calculation that talks about 25% of your own source of revenues as being the maximum. So, I'm not aware of any municipalities that are up that high. That's that's a significantly higher portion. Um, we had a policy that we would never go over 10%. That was in in place a few years ago, uh, but we've never reached that uh, that that total. Uh, we are now just under uh, around 5.5% of our own source funds, which again would be a fairly uh, uh, significant uh, on the positive side of what other municipalities are doing. Uh, other municipalities, some some have a lar uh, much larger debt balances than they, they do, but they've used it as a different funding opportunity. Uh, they have regular uh, borrowings 
uh, but our, our, our rate is about 5.5 percent. We'll have uh, we'll have more up-to-date information later in the year when the, the province uh, provides that for us. Okay. Um, yeah, you want to continue? Yeah, and sorry, to ironically, I left the button on. It worked out good. Uh, hard to hear our director of finance tonight. I don't know if your microphone's working or if uh, it's hard to hear a little bit tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> As a care said, you're putting yourself to sleep tonight, so I don't know about that. But uh, that wasn't funny. Uh, uh, so my question, because obviously we know it's a lot less expensive, and this kind of is directed through you and Mr. Holman, our director of uh, municipal works. It's less expensive to build to repair something than it is once it breaks and you have to replace it. So, and, and just if I could just get a little direct, because this again, I think it's for the people that, that are watching this. Preventative see, maintenance. Preventative maintenance. Uh, you know, a shave and pave versus a, and the other thing is where before we would pave a road and then a couple years later rip it up and redo the sewers. And there used to be this stuff a few years ago where the right hand and the left hand didn't seem to communicate that well, where now there's a lot more, I think, coordinated planning. Uh, that is also saving the taxpayer money. And it's a little more, I think it's a proactive planned out approach to doing the infrastructure. I don't know if, 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 if through you, Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, or we could hear back from maybe Mr. Holman on how you're working together to do just that. Sure, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the best investment that we could make on an infrastructure front would be to replace uh, the worst sewer on the worst road with the worst water main with the worst sidewalks. And, and in the past, we've relied or we've used the age of the infrastructure as a guide to, uh, to replacing it. Um, but what our studies are telling us is that, you know, just because something's old, you shouldn't necessarily throw it out. There's still some things that have some function. Um, uh, and uh, so we're looking at the condition of our sewer system, condition of our water main system, and focusing on those areas that um, have high risk in the event of failure. There's a lot of disruption to service, so it, uh, typically your larger uh, diameter mains, which serve a larger number of people, um, they will, um, they're the ones that we want to make sure are working all the time. Uh, and not just replacing things because they're old. Uh, and so uh, the, the more we know about our system, the more maintenance effort we put into extending the service life, uh, the better off we're going to be. There still are going to be those times that we're going to have to fix infrastructure uh, out of phase. Uh, you know, examples like Dorchester Road, we've got a number of complaints about it. It's hit the uh, CAA's worst road campaign for the last number of years, and we've been holding off uh, trying to see what our schedule is to replace the underground infrastructure. Uh, but at some point in time, and it might be this year, we're, we're going to have to do something with the road surface, even though uh, we know that, you know, in the next five to ten years, we're going to have to do some major underground work there. Some things just can't wait. And so, uh, and then also, you know, after winters like this, we're starting to see the impacts already with even just the, the temperature warming up. Uh, some of the roads starting to fall apart. Uh, so we really can't assess what roads are gonna to be top priority until at the end of March or April. But I know that the money that has been approved in the capital budget and what's being proposed here on the operations side uh, we'll have enough tools to spend them on the right money on the right things, and uh, I'm, I'm encouraging council to uh, to consider this uh, uh, spending of investment uh, investment on uh, on the infrastructure. I think we're doing a good job. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, you want to continue? Sure. I just want to. I don't want to hog the uh, thing. Just a couple other things if too I late. could. Too late. Oh, too late. Okay. Um, to, uh, back to, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Mr. Holman. Um, a couple, uh, something that was a real big issue a few years ago. So I, I've got three things if you could just, just weigh in on and then I, I promise I'll sit down. Why do you mean? For a little while. Uh, the one was a few years ago was uh, we had a big problem with fog with the fat oil and grease in the sewers in the city. I haven't heard much about it lately. I remember I went out one Christmas over the break and I had to, I didn't believe it. When the first time you, I remember the first time I sat here and I heard you say the problem on this street was oil and grease was why the sewer backed up. I, I didn't believe it. I had to go see it for myself and I saw the camera go down. I realized some people that cook and then they dump everything down the toilet because they think the toilet's safer than the sink. They don't realize it goes into the same uh, <coughs> basin. 
and once it hardens, calcifies, it becomes like rock, and then it's a serious problem, serious road surgery to fix it up. And I, when I got on the back of the Bob Robinson truck, I saw the camera and I could see what was going on and how the whole, it had totally calcified. So what's his current status? Any updates on fog? Chip and tar, tar and chip. I know you've been doing, you were doing some of that until the, it was time to actually do the final product. So I wondered how that experiment, because I'm big on innovation. I love when you're doing innovative things like that, that are creative and it makes more sense. And the last thing was the trench, trenchless technologies. I know, I think University of Waterloo was here doing some experimenting with us where you don't have to rip up the road to replace the sewer or line the sewer. So I just wondered if there's any updates on some of these uh, innovative approaches. So the fog and then um, the chip and tar and the trenchless. Thank you, that's it. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, the, the impact of fog has been reduced largely due to the education campaign that the region of Niagara has helped us with. Uh, we continue to have some areas that are uh, kind of chronic problems and we're going to work uh, both with a, a kind of a carrot and a stick um, uh, by encouraging people to participate and, and properly dispose of grease uh, and fats and oils uh, through the green bin system as opposed to dumping them in the sewer. Um, your comment about the surface treatment program, we've got uh, <coughs> capital budgets approved a couple million dollars towards improving the condition of our rural roads, which uh, have taken a beating over the last little while. And so we're, um, we're using uh, some new uh, technology to upgrade the base of the roads, trying recapture some of the investment we made in the past by recycling some of the asphalt. Um, I mean, that's something we paid for. We're, we're reusing it and finding a better use for it instead of having to dispose of it. Uh, so we're, uh, we're spending some uh, considerable dollars to try and get rid of the gravel roads in the city and, and beef up the condition of the roads uh, in the rural area. Uh, trenchless technology is something that uh, we've been looking at for the past number of years, but we haven't been able to get uh, a critical mass that would be large enough to attract competitive bids uh, from those experts that do this type of service. So there's probably a half a dozen contractors in the, in the area that would be able to do this type of thing. Um, they get busy very early, and in some cases, uh, it has been more cost effective for us to open cut uh, sewer replacements uh, instead of doing trenchless. However, the trenchless <laughs> technology is, is something that uh, we need to uh, explore further and uh, uh, would certainly be helpful, particularly in the core tourist area where we want to try and minimize the amount of disruption to public infrastructure during construction periods. You done? Okay, I have Councillor Morocco. Um, yes, the chair um, through to Todd Harrison. Just talk, Todd, what was the increase in the OLG? Um, we haven't we haven't done the final year yet. Uh, we have two payments, but it was a we were running about a uh, million dollars ahead from the first two quarters. So the end of uh, June and then the end of September, uh, we'll receive another check uh, and a report. Uh, around the 20th, 21st of January, so I can provide uh, a verbal update at least if I don't have a report at that period of time. But that's about a 9% increase. And that'll be the third quarter? That'll be the third quarter. And then the fourth is, quarter yeah. won't come until April. Yeah. So my question is, I know that we always look at trying not to have a tax increase, and I always support the cost of living as an increase, because if we don't, at some point, we have to play catch up. Um, is it possible that if, when we see an increase uh, <coughs> A bonus from the OLG. Is it possible that that some of that money could actually go to um, reduce the cost? Because I think we're looking at a 3.14% uh, increase. No, you're looking no. at a you're looking at a 2.6. 2.62. So if we were to take some of that um, bonus or additional money and put it towards the increase. Would we be able to do that? Uh, council makes the decision, so you can do whatever you choose to do. I would, I would suggest that uh, ten million or six million dollars, uh, already twenty-five percent of it, roughly, uh, already be allocated to tax subsidization. Uh, that that's a difficult trend 
to to maintain because then you're just deferring because that would be a one-time offer unless you're planning on then subsidizing a tax increase for uh, uh, for perpetuity. Um, I think one of the, the the difficulties is is that uh, you know we're updating our asset management plan this year to give council a full idea of what types of things were out there. Well, we will in the longer term have to fund the hospital portion once it is constructed, and you know to to make a one-term offer to reduce the tax levy for a particular year, I think would be. Um, wouldn't be something that I would suggest that you do, but uh, well, it's a question that will be asked by taxpayers. Certainly. So you get more money. Why can't you put it towards the taxes? So I'm asking that question yeah. so that people will okay. hear the answer. But, and the but again, from. I think if you know, Councillor Peter Angelo asked us to show this chart, and this is uh, these are the five the, these are the five things that were asked right. in the in the mm -hmm. like so they were asked to choose which yep. one they like, and you can see by that uh, that infrastructure and the hospital were the ones that were chosen for the majority of the time. And I think that would be where you'd want it to, to go. Obviously, people don't like paying property taxes. They don't like paying increased water. There, there's no <coughs> doubt about it. But I think the days of having no tax levy or a reduced a zero tax levy is, is short-sighted. And I don't think it does. Yeah. That, that, that's my personal opinion. Well, because we're constantly replacing equipment and the cost of fuel is always going. So there's always a cost that's increasing. And if we don't keep up, we understand that that's we, I've always, up. you know, I look around with my, my peers here. They all know what they put in for their budget. And we go through a process. We, being Ken, uh, the CAO and I, we go through a process and reduce the expenditure level to something that is palatable for the council to consider. Because if I came in with a 12% expenditure increase, I don't think that that would be acceptable. However, there are cost pressures, and that's why I did put that in, that there are things coming down the pipe that you're going to have to address. You or the future councillors are going to have to address. To use a one-time fund because we got more money in a particular year from the OLG, I don't think is a prudent, uh, is a prudent okay. way to Thank go. You. However, again, I respect the council because the council gets to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to uh, ask that question because that is a question that is asked. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll just get yep. that off our plate. But I think another point too that I would like to ask through the chair uh, is to Mr. Holman. This year, I think we've seen more emails than ever before about uh, what broken water mains, and I think because of the cold and the frost and that, and that has to have a huge impact on our budget staffing and just the repairs uh, alone. I think that all of us have seen uh, unbelievable numbers that have come in. Although I have to say that as a councillor, I think that like the rest of us around here are very pleased with the amount of money that we've spent in the last years that we've been on council putting into our infrastructure, our roads for repair. But still, it's just mind-boggling to see how many of these uh, emails that are coming through from the city in regards to broken water mains. Uh, is that an over, over and by this? Because we don't expect that because of this cold weather, obviously. Yeah. I'll, uh, can I answer for Sure, Mr. you Holt? can. <laughs> uh, 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 the reason being that uh, that's going to be addressed in your t utility budget because we're right now water main replacement, uh, water, water, water fix, uh, that's done in the utility budget. Uh, one of the reasons we're deferring it a couple of months is to kind of get a better idea of what those costs are because of the cold weather we've experienced that. Um, that would be an additional cost. Like normally those call outs are on overtime. and. The staff have to go out and address it, and there is a certain number of uh, breakages that are anticipated and built into the budget. Uh, but we'll have a better idea when we address the budget in February uh, as to what the impact would be and whether, you know, the utility uh, needs to increase the fees or whether we can compensate. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we try to, you know, when we have a maybe a extra money in a prior year. And one of the things, and I think it was Councillor Campbell asked me about snow plowing. In previous years, we've We've, we've budgeted X amount of dollars for snow plowing. We haven't incurred it because of the, the weather hadn't incurred. And then you carry forward that, you reserve that money and you use it. For this year, we may end up spending it. And it's a similar type of thing for the, those types of water main breaks. So um, just one point. So the cost of living increase is, is one point we were talking, if we just did a cost of living. Well, again, it depends on what stat can, Stats Canada uh, benchmark you use. Mm -hmm. It's anywhere from 1.7 to 2. Two yeah. percent. Um, municipalities tend to have a higher inflationary rate because of <coughs> certain costs are higher. Um, 
Yeah. So our calculation that we're looking at right now really covers the cost of living plus a bit more. It's not uh, much more. Yeah, uh, it does. But you know, I I would say that uh, some of the uh, labor costs that we are going to have to pay are higher than what are faced out in the common uh, place uh, because of negotiated agreements and arbitrated agreements. And uh, there's other expenditures that are that are there that we are facing that are others aren't facing so we might be a little bit higher but yeah that the answer short answer to that is yes thank you any other questions of mr. Harrison oh council carrier uh, thank you uh, I'm not sure if anybody's prepared to make a decision tonight um, no. and I don't think they are um, the other thing I was going to ask was I happened to call up and ask and councillor my Morocco asked I know I'm the one that asked and was pushing to get everything electronic, but I could not read the budget on my on my iPad. So I think it's almost imperative that we have to have this for the numbers. Can't see them on the iPad. So I just got this. So yeah. I want to have an opportunity to go through it and, and look at it a little closer. So I'm assuming that when there's a when the time comes will be a motion to defer it maybe to the next meeting or two meetings from now. But um, just a couple of comments based on some of the things that were said tonight by uh, the chairman, Councilor Morocco and the other councillors. When, when I look at what you gave us from some of the other municipalities, their increase is 1.7, 2.6, 5.6. They seem to be able to do it without a 20 or $25 million bonus from the province. And they're only one, two. It's becoming very difficult to explain how over the past four years we could get almost $100 million. I understand your explanation of where the money went. It's still very difficult to explain to taxpayers how we get this bonus of $100 million. And some of the taxpayers haven't seen any of it. They haven't seen, we haven't seen a year where we absolutely had zero. So I think if we're going to defer it, I'd like to see you go back and see if there's any, any other things that you might come up with to bring it back down. I know we could take OLG money. I don't know if I'm a proponent of that of subsidizing more of the operating budget with more of the OLG money. I think that's short-sighted. I think next year you're going to have a bonus. I think that we all know that somehow in this discussion about the, the tax or the subsidization, I think that the tourist industry is going to come up with some way to alleviate the city from paying some of the things that we're paying for now. I hope that's going to be a, a windfall to the city of two, three, four points, whatever. Um, but I think it would be good that if you came back and gave us some alternatives on what we could do, where we might be able to take some money, where we might be able to cut, along with us going back and looking at the budget and seeing if there's anything we see, meet in whatever, another two weeks, three weeks, four weeks or whatever, and make the decision. But I'd like to see some alternatives to be able to not have a 2.65% 2, 2 increase, becoming very difficult to explain how we get all this money. And the average taxpayer says to me, I've got an increase every year. You've got this 20 plus million dollars every year, <coughs> and, and I haven't seen any of the benefit of it. So that would be my motion when the time comes. Okay, so there's a motion to refer the budget back to staff and that staff bring back options so that council can look at uh, reducing any type of tax increase. Are you seconding that? Okay, seconded by Councillor Iannone. I know Councillor Iannone would like to speak to it, Councillor Thompson as well. Oh. Yes, I, I just. Uh, interesting to see when you have a conflict of interest that you can make comments about the tax issue. Uh, maybe I can do that too. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I, I was uh, interested in, in the uh, police uh, budget which we right. received and I was uh, ready to speak on that tonight but it's coming back on the 13th. Now, how does that uh, how are you dealing with that in the budget uh, for this year? You're just putting the 4.2 million in and dealing with it. Uh, it it's going to be a very difficult situation. I uh, can understand the mayor at the region, uh, uh, but you have statistical information now that indicates that uh, we're no different than St. Catharines as far as uh, the number of calls we get and uh, a lot of the calls have absolutely nothing to do with the uh, casino uh, and yet we're uh, because I signed a deal because I had to the same as Windsor to have six police officers 
to start out in a casino unit and because they have all of the money uh, from the casinos uh, each year, uh, oh yeah, you can have another five, you can have another five the next year and we have 33 or more uh, people in a uh, casino unit. Uh, not that we want less police or less policing. Uh, I just think that this is unique. I'd like to know what Windsor has done. They used to have a casino unit. I don't think they do anymore. Uh, it has moved out of their quarters. We don't have any indication that there's a savings there moving everybody and not having this building <coughs> maintained. So I'm looking forward to a, a real debate on this, but uh, in spite of that, I feel that it's gonna be extremely difficult when you get to the region uh, to see that the region is gonna take on that responsibility. But I think it's uh, a debate and a discussion that we have to have because it's huge as far as uh, we are concerned. The other uh, thing that uh, we passed at our last meeting, a report which was uh, uh, regarding uh, parking uh, in the city and uh, giving a, uh, approval to a report to adjust the fees. Um, I hope that that's gonna come back at the next meeting so we can have a full discussion about that because uh, uh, increasing the, t the uh, parking fees in the tourist area and different areas I think is appropriate. But I was actually shocked and had many phone calls from people who were saying, are you telling me they ha on the street they have to uh, pay $40 to park on New Year's Eve uh, in the parking area? Um, that was uh, something that I didn't expect, didn't know, wasn't in the report, so I hope we have the opportunity to have a discussion and a debate on that in the future. Do you have any comment? Um, yes, I can, I can bring that forward. You want to um, bring it up to 50? No, no, not at all. <coughs> when you look at the situation um, and the overall parking revenues leading up that week between Boxing, uh, Boxing Day and New Year's, that the, the, the revenue stayed the same even though the weather was the way it was um, and there were adjustments that, that took place. The one adjustment that took place New Year's Eve was only on New Year's Eve and on that situation, on street, there was 108 parking spaces that were $40 flat rate and there was 153 that were $20 flat rate. So there was, and, and that was advertised in, in the, on the web website, the city website that indicated what they are. So we were in line in the $20 area and perhaps out of line in the $40 area. But again, our first sort of kick at, at doing this, uh, we're gonna get better with it and we're gonna be able to align uh, the values better. So this is kind of our first kick at it. Uh, but from a, from a revenue perspective, with the adjustments we made, we remained uh, the same as, as the revenues that we achieved last year. In spite of the cold weather. In spite of the cold weather, yes. Yeah. Anyway, I think uh, I would have felt a lot better if we had had some indications what the increases were going to be. Uh, like when I hear $40, uh, you know, and this is not visitors coming from Toronto. A lot of the local people go down there and this is what they experience. So I think we have to really have a close look. I would have been very happy with the report if there had have been some examples that we could have debated and discussed and made some de decisions on rather than just saying increasing uh, at the appropriate time. So thank you. Absolutely. Oh, thank it's you. coming back. Yeah, it's going to come back to us. Councillor Ainoni. Thank you. And just to piggyback on Councillor Thompson's comment about the casino patrol unit, the Police Service Act says the police have to police where there's an issue. So it would be hard pressed for the region to say, no, we're not going to take it over because they're mandated to do that anyway. So that gives us an, an, an out, I think. I mean, I, I know the Police Service Act and 
if there's an issue down there, they got to be there. We should not be augmenting their pay. And they, I, I wanted to ask about this city open-ended responses from budget engagement survey. I don't know if anybody's been reading them while we sit here, but I've been having yep. a hard time not laughing out loud. That's um, enough. Yeah, and some of these things are are they have they're not right. But most of it says they're not happy with us as we go through this. So somehow we're not getting our alignment with residents' needs out there to the public when you read this. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation in here in regards to how tourism, how tourism tax gets paid to the city and, and, and what tourism is paying for. I can't remember, but if I'm not mistaken, you're paying tourism is paying $2,800 a year per room, I think. Over 4,000 4, a year per room, but you've got some things in here. It says, you know, our property taxes are funding the tourism, the tourism area. They're not. They're funding it themselves. But I'm just wondering for the for the answers in here, are is this online for people to read the public's comments, and is it possible for us maybe to give a brief response because you know misinformation gets spread, and if this is what they think, this is nowhere clear to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, are we answering these? Can ask Mr. Harrison. Is that, is that no, the, is the top line on the second page? Is that? I think that was at you? you, right? That was at you. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, the comments that you're reading are the comments that were attached to the individual surveys. Mm -hmm. So, they would be no different than comments that are attached to a review article uh, online. It's, but they're not. And t they were never, they're not posted anywhere where everybody, it's not a forum like uh, Facebook where everybody can, can uh, to deal with it. The information was provided to you so that you got a feeling for what the comments were from the 200 or so people that filled out uh, the, the, uh, the, applica the uh, responses. So uh, there was never an intention to respond to everybody. Uh, some of the comments are, you know, quite informed that some of them aren't. Some of them are positive and suggestions for improvement, and some of them aren't. Um, they're there as information, they're the public, and they're provided for the council to, to, to do with it, but it's not an intention of staff to respond to all those questions. Okay. But these aren't confidential. Like, this is a survey we ran and answers we got, correct? Correct. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just want to be sure, because I really appreciate what Councillor Carrio said. The motion that we're going to vote on, that we're deferring it back to staff, and we're directing staff to reduce. That's correct. And we're going to attach a figure to it, or are we just saying go I back and reduce? Option. I just want my, my motion to just come back with some options for Council to discuss. Okay. The other thing, uh, and I do want to share with Council, is it's the first time in all the years that I have been around that I've had many calls, and it, it does scare me when I get these kind of calls. Uh, and we know there's a crisis with affordable housing. We know people are waiting seven, eight, nine years to try to get into affordable housing. But it's the first time that I've ever had a number of calls, and I can even tell you some of the people who call me, because some, some of us would know these people. They're seniors, and they're calling and saying, I can no longer afford him to stay in my house. I can't even afford the apartment anymore because apartments are going up, the rent is going up, the cost of homes are going up. And so they're asking, is there anything that can be done to get me into affordable housing, which is virtually impossible because there's already a waiting list of six or seven years for people. And it just scares me thinking that, is that the future for our seniors where they can alone no longer afford to stay in their homes or in their apartments? And then it reflects back when you talk to some of them, and, you, and I do, and we all do, you have conversations. Then it comes back to a lot of what has been said around this table, can't afford the taxes that keep going up. And, and, and they ask that question constantly. You get this money from the casino, how come? And points were really made very, very um, succinctly by the, around the table that maybe we're not getting the message out of all the good things that we do, but there's just so much to do. You realize how, you hate to think it, how serious our infrastructure crisis is in the city when you realize we're getting 100,000 uh, 
million and we're still not able to bring it down to the level that the public feels. And you heard about Dorchester Road, which I travel every day. The list goes on. So I just wanted to be clear, so we're gonna be, I mean, I'm gonna support it. We're voting on a motion to defer and to bring it back with a, a reduced. Uh, and I, I do feel, and Councilor Thompson, I'm looking forward to his report coming out that there may be something there that may reduce the cost of our policing and then that can be passed on to the taxpayers. So then I'm gonna be supporting the, the motion as well. So thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to talk actually about affordable housing because I mean, since there is such a need, perhaps it's worthwhile to send a resolution on to the regional government and to ask uh, them to look at regional housing from the standpoint that you know, perhaps uh, some incentive program should be put in place and whether it only be to cover the soft costs such as development charges or permit fees or even tax subsidies. I mean, I think the more that the more affordable housing that they can get built, the better. Um, I mean, if you take a look at it as though they're, you know, if they don't build any within the next five years, then they're not going to collect any tax dollars anyway. So if there's a subsidy, then at least whatever they get built that they can collect on. Um, I think it would be a good way to actually kickstart it. I'm not sure if you're interested in a resolution such as that. So. I will. I, I, I can take that after. Sorry, Councillor Iannone, you wanted to talk on this. And in regard to the, yeah, on, on, in regard to the affordable housing, we, if I'm not mistaken, we're waiting for a report to come back to us in regards to allowing people to build granny flats in the back of their properties. I, we heard from a lot, I've heard from so many seniors who said, at the end of the day, I'm gonna end up living with my kids. I don't wanna live in a senior's building, I don't wanna be in assisted care, I wanna live with my kids. But I don't wanna live in the basement. I don't wanna live underground, I don't wanna have no windows. And if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Herlivik said, we're two years past the time where the province said, were to come up with some sort of a bylaw to allow for granny flats and secondary apartments. And I know the Airbnb issue has confused it, but it's also put us drastically behind in allowing families to provide affordable care to seniors who are gonna need it. So, yeah, and, well, <laughs> yeah, we don't want them living back in the house with us, so you build them a house in the back. But the reality is, Airbnb is, has really confused that. So I, I had somebody through this whole, through the whole um, homelessness issue and, and say to me, well, uh, my mother doesn't want to live in a home. I, I've called the city, a granny flat is not allowed, you guys are behind. We really need to have that report come so that we can deal with it, maybe separate and aside from Airbnbs, and so that people who have senior parents on a list can maybe put something in place, because right now we don't allow it. Okay, and perhaps I can uh, have Mr. Mech um, uh, comment on that as, uh, as he's filling in tonight for uh, Mr. Herlovich, but um, my understanding was that the provincial growth plan um, allowed for second dwelling units inside of single family homes. Um, now a second dwelling unit would be different than having a family member move in, but I'll let Mr. Mech uh, explain perhaps. Uh, it's my understanding that it was a council directive previously to combine the two issues. So if there's a direction to uh, separate them, that we could do that, and there may be some serious value in doing that. But you know, I had a conversation with uh, Alderman Thompson this week and reminded him. I'm sorry, reminded him that uh, yes, the province had put that in motion a number of years ago, but there was, at the time, there was a reluctance uh, of, on council's part to advance that, and perhaps we've gone to the point where, you know, we, we need to get on with business, and we can separate those two issues. Uh, we were hoping to report back to council uh, in the first quarter of this year, at, at the latest, the second quarter, <coughs> and we can bring that back. So just to answer the question, is there a difference between having a, a family member move in with you? We can't differentiate to between, between occupants, uh, second dwelling units. There's no control over who's occupying that space. Okay. All right. Yep. So maybe at the end of the, when we move on to new business, I'll put a motion on the floor asking them to separate the issues and bring us back a report in regards to a secondary home. You can build it and you're going to run an Airbnb. I mean, I'm getting calls all, all the time from 
homes that were $800,000 out in Chippewa and they said, I've got six Airbnbs on my street. I wouldn't have bought a home here if I'd have thought that I was going to be beside an Airbnb owned by somebody out of town. So you can't guarantee, but there are sincerely families out there that want to build a second unit for a family member who cannot afford or they don't want to put in a retirement home or assisted living or regional housing. And it's incumbent upon us to give them the tool to be able to do that. And right now, we're the only body holding that up. <coughs> Councilor Thompson. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, if we're gonna send out a resolution regarding uh, assisted housing, um, I think it's a waste of time sending it to the region. I think you have to send it to all levels of government, federal, provincial, and regional. That's the only way you're gonna have any impact on uh, subsidized housing. Because as you know now, what is it? Uh, f uh, five, 600 people waiting on a list. Takes them six years to uh, get uh, assisted housing. It isn't <coughs> gonna happen with the region uh, putting something in their budget. This is a serious problem uh, across Canada, particularly in the province, and we experience it in this municipality. Every level of government should start taking it as a very serious problem, housing. Uh, look what's happening in Toronto. People, young people, can't even afford to live in Toronto because of the cost of housing. A million dollars for the average home over there, it's, and it's gonna get worse. So if we're talking about a resolution uh, regarding subsidized housing, let's please include every member uh, of government, uh, federal, provincial, and uh, regional. And, and we're probably gonna have to do our part too, because that's how serious the problem is. Uh, okay. Hopefully, so we, we take that well, uh, take that into consideration. Yeah, I already have a motion on the floor to refer the budget over to staff, and perhaps a resolution yeah. that deals with affordable housing can come under new business. Probably more appropriate to do that. <coughs> Mr. Harrison, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say to you, Mr. Budget Chair, that uh, the province must have been listening to the conversation because I'm just opening an email uh, that was sent by the someone at the Ministry of Housing and they are uh, looking for expressions of interest from municipalities to involve in a development charges uh, rebate program for, yeah. for uh, affordable housing. So I, again, I think the province has uh, identified this, but uh, we'll go. report back on that as well as part of uh, 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 the rest of the discussion when what we agree to know more about it. Yep. Just, just for your information. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, maybe from um, Mr. Mack, a little clarity. I'm, I'm, I'm just not totally understanding the situation on having the secondary dwellings. Sure. So the, the province has already passed something. In say, their provincial growth plan. In the provincial growth plan. We were supposed to adopt it into our planning. Exactly. Budget. And I believe, did we not defer it? We did. Count? We, we did. We deferred so it, and I think it. we had a public meeting as well. So there's people out there that need affordable places, and we've deferred it. And so we're behind two years. So we're, we're talking about all levels of government. We're guilty too. We haven't done our job. So my question is this. So right now, so for clarity, are we currently enforcing? So when we go to a house, I think I already know the answer. We go to a house and we find out someone's living in the house and they're not part of the family, right? Like the door's locked. We're writing them up and we're targeting them because, well, I got a call from uh, uh, an individual in the city uh, who had someone living in the house and the city wrote him up and said you you can't have two dwellings <coughs> within the house in a residential area. So I'm a little bit uh, confused about what the status is. So I don't know if Mr. Mech could answer what the cur what is currently allowed in the city. So are we actively enforcing that you can't do it, or are we leaning toward the way we're going to have to go? I'm I'm just not sure what the status is. Okay. Um, perhaps you can comment on what the status is, and then maybe I'll get someone else to comment on enforcement. I, I can comment on both, I believe. Oh, okay, great. But I didn't know that. You yes, you're right. The province has enacted the legislation to allow us to do it, but we have, haven't taken our steps yet. So if someone complains that there's a second dwelling unit in a house, we will investigate it and confirm that the zoning 
doesn't allow it, and we'll enforce it. We have, we have no choice at this point in time because we haven't, uh, we're, we're, we're behind. There's a lot of municipalities in the region that have already done this and they, they've seen it happen. And I mean, there are people that are doing it illegally, uh, you know, for years and years and years. Mr. Tutt, if I could just briefly add to that, and the issue we have as well is that once we have a complaint and if there's an illegal unit, generally they've been built without building permit and proper fire inspection, so once we know we, we have to go in and do building and fire inspection, just, uh, it's not, it's, it's not allowed, <coughs> but even once we know you've got somebody living there in a legal space that isn't compliant with other regulations as well, so it's a catch-22 for us, and, uh, but Mr. Mech's quite right. Uh, when we did have the report here a couple months back, um, it got caught up, as Councillor Iannone has indicated, with the whole Airbnb discussion, and they were coupled together, and the whole issue was deferred. So we're now out having public meetings on it. We had a, quite a large meeting at the McBain Center a couple months ago, <coughs> like over 200 people. But the main focus was on Airbnb, but the whole second dwelling unit issue as of right, second dwelling unit got caught up in the whole debate. Councilor Ainone. And when I had a discussion with Alex about that, he said because we were behind so long that those things weren't happening. And he said if you read the paper, when you bought, op open the real estate section of the paper and you read has in-law suite, you know, single family home with in-law suite, that in-law suite isn't approved. <coughs> we haven't approved anything with an in-law suite. So you can read those in the paper for sale every weekend. He said, because we're so far behind, we're really not enforcing that. Because our bylaw uh, could be out there, just read the Saturday paper, and you could be at every house that advertised on selling with an in-law suite. So it, it really is incumbent upon us, and I'll make that motion, to have staff bring back that report on, on a second dwelling and or granny flat and separate it from the Airbnb <coughs> issue because that makes it so much more confusing than people who just want to either augment their income or have a family member in there. Okay, thanks. Councillor Thompson. I will uh, second the motion because we have to deal with that. But uh, I think when you're talking about in-laws, I think if it's family members, uh, they have the right to be there anyway, don't they? Not in a separate dwelling unit. If they're living as one unit, that's fine. But if they're separate dwelling units, well, what do you mean, a door between yeah. one set? If, yeah. if, if they can function independently, <coughs> considered. We have them all over the place. Uh, <laughs> okay, so right now there is a motion on the floor uh, that asks us to send the budget back to staff. There's a couple other issues, affordable housing, second dwelling units that people want to um, make motions on, but I'll have to take those after the budget motion. Is, is there any other comments from Mr. Harrison on the budget? No, Mr. Mayor. Well, uh, I was hoping that the first number that he comes back with is gonna be a one, I was hoping. That was my, uh, my, my, my hope too. I'm, I'm, I'm with Councillor Kerry over here that I, like, I think the number is a little high and I think that we can come down. And although I've heard same thing, you guys get this extra OLG money every year, but I mean, you gotta look around, you see, we got a lot of things other communities don't have uh, at the same time. We're in a very enviable position and financially sound. But having said that, everybody's sensitive to the increase and especially in the commercial sector where 1% is different than 1% in the residential sector. It hits them uh, harder. I definitely think that uh, I'd like to see that first number come back, the first number to come back with a one anyway. So thank you. Okay. If there aren't any more comments, I just want to ask Mr. Matson once again to uh, perhaps go to question number eight. Um, Mr. Harrison's going to love me for this one, but probably about five years ago, I think I was bugging the heck out of him, kicking and screaming that I didn't want to take on any more debt uh, with the city. If you take a look at the people that answered no to are you open to taking on more debt it was 23 percent that flat out said no there was 56 percent that basically said no only on large investments so if you add those two up it's 79 percent 80 percent of the public does not support us taking on new debt now i guess council can take some comfort in the fact that our overall debt this term dropped by 22 percent 
and our overall debt servicing costs went down by 26%. But in the future, I really hope that we continue the trend. And whether there's a municipal building that needs a new HVAC, or whether there's a new building that we bought that we want to refurbish, I hope we don't take on debt unless it's a giant project. That's the only thing I wanted to say because that's what the public wants us to do. So there is a motion on the floor to uh, send the budget back to Mr. Harrison and see what he comes back with. I'll call that vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried, thank you. And then I know there's a couple uh, resolutions that want to be made. Um, first one, affordable housing. Councilor Crater, did you want to do that? Affordable housing. Before I do that, uh, through you to, uh, to Mr. Harrison, can you can you read back that email that you said you just got and what the province is proposing? Well, the province has just sent out. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, to through to Councillor Crater. Uh, the province has sent out a email to all the treasurers and directors of planners throughout the province to indicate that there's a discussion about an expression of interest for municipalities that want to be part of the development charges rebate program. So it's really at the initial stages, Councillor. I still think that probably if you want to go forward with a resolution, it would be wise to do that. I'm just saying that the province is, seems to be aware of the concerns that the Council is raising and uh, are addressing it. But certainly it wouldn't do any harm to do that. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. So yes, I'll go ahead with my motion. Uh, first of all, uh, Councillor Thompson is 100% correct, just sending it to the region. They've got an, you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a fan of the region anyway to begin with. I think they waste money like water. I'm so frustrated watching what's going on up there. But, I mean, that's one of the bodies we have to go to. But I totally agree with them if we're going to be sincere about this, that we need to send it to all the different levels of government. I think the government of Canada is starting something that they're proposing. I just saw it the other day. So I will go make a motion that we contact all the lever levels of government with the request, um, and I liked your wording, so you just go ahead and come forward with it. Okay, I'll fill it in after. I have that seconded by Councilor Thompson. If there aren't any questions, then I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed motions carried. And the last one would be in regards to the second dwelling units, Councilor Arinoni. Yeah, I asked staff to bring, a motion to, for staff to bring back a report to allow second dwelling or granny flats. Okay, is there a seconder to that motion? Seconded by Councilor Campbell. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor? Opposed, motions carried. Okay, I believe that takes care of the budget for us, so I will pass it back over to the mayor. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to the consent agenda, and I've got Councillor Cario. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I have, just have a qu question on, uh, and I see that the CEO left the building, so I'm not sure um, how things get on the consent agenda and what the criteria is. What's the criteria for something being put on the consent agenda? Is there a criteria? What makes it? What doesn't make it? Well, traditionally, any report that's coming to council, if it if it's felt that it's not going to uh, ensue any type of debate, it's typically put on the consent agenda. As the uh, order of business indicates, it's there to save time. Uh, however, as we've done every meeting, uh, the mayor does give all the council an opportunity if you want to lift something from the agenda and have any general discussion on that. I understand. I just didn't know whether or not the staff, if we had a criteria, I think if we don't have a criteria, we should have a criteria. Because I think the consent agenda is something that most of us look at thinking that it won't require a lot of debate. It probably shouldn't cost the taxpayers any money. It sh we should have a criteria. And I would, I would ask if any of the other councillors think that way or feel that way. But I think that there should be a criteria. 
that it shouldn't be uh, so gray. So depending on Mr. Beeman. Just to uh, Mr. Yeah, Sorry, Mr. Beeman. To the council's concern, uh, we are uh, under instruction to prepare a new procedural bylaw currently. And uh, if with council's direction, we could just enter that uh, into developing criteria for uh, more uh, precise criteria for determining what goes on the consent agenda as part of that procedural uh, that we could incorporate Councillor Cario's concerns within an ongoing process, which is all council has already instructed us to undertake. Um, there'd be an economy of effort in that if council is uh, so desires to have uh, more clear criteria. I think it's important. I don't know what the other councillors feel about, but I think it's important. The other thing that I think is important is that the way we do this now with the uh, electronic agendas, if there's an addition to the agenda, I think we need a place where not only it gets put into the agenda, but there's a place where there's additions. So once this comes out, if anything else is placed on this agenda, it also shows up in a place. Like when we used to get these, we used to get the X, we used to get these, we know they were additions. We knew they were additions. Sometimes, if we read our agenda on our on our iPads, and then and then uh, we think that we've read it, and as similarly it happened last week or a couple of weeks ago, and you don't go back and look at that again, something's been added and we don't know it, so we may not read that item again. So if there's an addition, I think it should be listed somewhere as an addition, <coughs> where it is that we can find it, but it's also listed as an addition on this agenda. So we know it's been added after this originally came out. I think it's important so that it flags it for us, that we go back and look if it's a change or whatever. And then, like I said, I think it's important to have a criteria for the consent agenda. It's my own feeling. Do you want to make that a motion? Uh, I, I, I would make it a motion and then see if it sparks some other comments from some other well, counselors. It's something I mentioned before, too. Yeah, OK. So we've got a motion by Councilor Cario, seconded by uh, Councilor Morocco. <coughs> that the consent agenda have criteria around what gets put there versus a report and on what, And what doesn't. So right. what cannot be on the consent agenda? Yeah. Something that cost us taxpayers money probably shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be said. And the second part was? If, if there's an addition. Yeah, addition to the agenda. An addition to our, it, it should be, in some it should sit in the yeah. addition section so that it showed up as, as an addition. That you realize it's something new. And you better go look for it. it right. It's stuck in here somewhere. Yeah. But it's an addition to what was originally put out, so we go looking for it. And I think that that part's through our clerk's office. Is that right? I think, uh, yeah. So they'll, they've got, they work with the computer, the company, right? Uh, uh, iCompass or whatever, to fix things up. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the motion. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? I'll speak on it. You want to speak on it, Councillor? Yeah, I thought you were still. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to support uh, Councillor, but you know, this is how I feel. Forget the consent agenda. Just put everything on it. If it takes a little longer to have a council meeting, so what? You only have 10 or 11, you said, left. Well, just because it's election year, and I'm not counting after. No, no I'm not kidding. I'm just saying. That's just how I feel. I'm okay. Because I'm too fr so frustrated. I'm okay. I am so frustrated of what's happened the last couple of council meetings. I'm trying not to be critical, but things are showing up in that consent agenda, and it's kind of my fault too. And there's some, one time there was like 14 things, and you didn't sit, you're trying to read them, trying to figure things out. Just put it on. Have the staff here who are there if we have questions about it, and then we'll ask them. So I'm not trying to be critical of your motion. I'm supporting you, but I'm, I'm, I'd rather amend, just. What if we amend the motion to no say, more agenda? No, but from here on, put it on. Not have the consent agenda. agenda. If we stay an extra half an hour, it should all be. That's my feeling. But, but I would amend that, Councillor, to say, yeah. how about let's have no consent agenda until the staff comes back with the criteria and see if we like the criteria. That's, that's fine. Yeah. That's a good amendment. Thanks. <coughs> okay. So we just ask staff to come. Well, and, and Mr. Mayor, uh, with respect to the consent agenda, the consent agenda is just a way to uh, present the agenda in categories. And typically what we've done when we go through the uh, council review, we will put under the report section generally items that have a presentation or are, are going to need some lengthy discussion by staff. The items that are to consent are generally items that are items that uh, <coughs> tenders, things of that nature, or just items that we really don't think that are uh, 
uh, are going to spark much debate because there's really not a heck of a lot of explanation that's required by staff of that report. But at any time, any counselor can pull any or all of those items. Uh, it's not like they're, there's an attempt there to hide them. They're, they're public items. They're just listed separately uh, as an attempt to get a single motion. But if a counselor, and it happens every week where two or three of the consent agenda items will get lifted and voted on separately. So, uh, I mean, it's just a, a, a method to categorize. There's really no, on most of the items, no rhyme or reason as to how they're on the consent agenda, other than it's sort of staff's expectation that there's not a, a lot of explanation needed to be given by staff to explain the report or present the report to council. The ones that are listed as reports typically require you know, they have a, a detailed presentation or staff is going to get up like we did tonight on the budget and give you a detailed presentation on something. So, um, you know, we can bring back a report to just talk about how we might structure that better, but, um, you know, our, our sort of approach up to this point is that any of those items or all of those items can be voted and lifted and voted on separately. It was just really a mechanism to try to get a, a blanket agenda where you'd pass five or six items at once and it would just speed the agenda up a bit, so. Can I make a comment on that? Yep, yeah, you still have the floor. The problem is though, um, that if we happen to miss it, it gets voted on without any debate, it can get missed. The other things that are being spoken on, item by item, or uh, thing about you know, everything on its own, we don't miss them. I don't really, I have a conflict on why I can't say what I'm thinking. Somebody else might, but I can't. Yeah. But consent agenda item, you wouldn't think that hit the consent agenda, doesn't meet your explanation. But, but, I, but counsel, in fairness, I, I think to your point, even if that item hadn't been on the consent agenda, it was an additional item. Right. So was, I think what your comment is, regardless, it you're addition. saying it, it was an addition anyway. So regardless of where it was on the agenda, admittedly, that was a report that came late. So it really didn't matter where it was on the agenda because it was it was a last. It's easier, it's easier to miss on the consent agenda. Yeah. So, but the motion stands. My motion stands. So. I don't know. So I, I, you know, we can come back with some ideas for you. Uh, I can tell you, uh, and Mr. Matson will probably. I know there's been a number of municipalities that we've talked to recently that are actually going the other way. They're trying to find ways to get items or create a consent because it, it moves on along the efficiency of the agenda. So. Uh, we hear you in terms of if there are routine items that, you know, tenders and things of that nature that you really don't expect any debate on, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can just be a little bit more mindful of what goes on the consent that's agenda. Fine, that's my motion is, if you tell us what the criteria is, then we'll decide whether we like it or not. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, I've got uh, Councilor Inoni, then Thompson. Thank you. And really, it's, it's our will. If we don't it like the consent agenda and we feel we've missed items, and I, I feel like that all the time because we're trying to get through our council agenda, it's up to us whether we want a consent agenda on there or not. But, I, but on where I think Councillor Carrio was going, I watched the meeting today where you passed where the transient ta tax hit, because I, I was out of the country. The transient tax hit, the conversation took place, and the vote went through. And that item, the transit tax item, if I'm if I'm mis if I'm correct, you got a letter from the minister on Friday. It hit council email on Monday as an addition, and it was discussed Tuesday. It didn't even go through senior staff. So I don't. That is such a huge issue. Like I watched the debate today so that I could speak informed about it on it tonight. And if we have a business that wants to open up in a tourist corridor, generally we say to that business, have you talked to the BIA? Have you spoke to Niagara Falls Tourism? We have the stakeholders speak before that. That's a huge item. It was a big issue. Um, I, I watched the, the correction of the motion. I watched where Councillor uh, Crater made the motion and Mr. Todd was, says to you, have it be in principle in condition of we're making the motions and i think that something as big as the consent agenda uh, as the transient tax and you could have called it hotel tax at least we would have known what it was but hotel tax gives us a red flag that says maybe things are going in there that shouldn't and i understand why he wants a, a, a better criteria 
because I don't, I can't for the life of me understand how that ended up in a consent agenda. Okay, uh, Councilor Thompson, and then Morocco. Well, um, I, I like the con consent ag agenda. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with it. Most of the uh, um, things, just like today, uh, are tenders. Um, they're, you know, everything is there. And I read the consent agenda just like I read every other report. What's the problem here? That one report is an example that shouldn't have been there. Uh, it uh, was, uh, um, came in at the last minute, and uh, I agree, it shouldn't have been there. But that shouldn't sabotage the whole idea of the consent agenda. And do I read the, uh, the, the uh, council reports and come to the consent agenda and just go to slip through them without reading them? No, read them all. That's not a problem. Okay, so we've got two parts to the motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Morocco. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I think I brought up the, the points before too. If we have something new that's added in, especially uh, at the 11th hour, it is nice to have it highlighted and set out because you do get it on that and you have to go into the program. And I do appreciate because most of the time our, our clerk's department, Teresa, is very good at sending out um, and a reminder that this is an addition. But uh, when you go back in to find that in that uh, huge document, it's a little difficult to go mm -hmm. through uh, and try and pull it out. So I think that is one of the situations that happened and I think we had that conversation too at the last council meeting. You know, why some of the things that are in a consent agenda that shouldn't be there. I also support the consent agenda because there is a lot of things that, you know, we all read and that's how we kind of catch the things. But uh, I think that uh, basically having that information highlighted and given to us that, you know, a flag, that there's something new added is a, is a huge uh, thing and I think that would have been a uh, a saver for that last report that everyone's talking about as well. So I'll um, support having more information highlighted. Okay, thank you. Did you have your hand up, Councilor? No, okay. Okay, so the, um, just so reminder, so two parts. Number one is the consent agenda. We're gonna have, ask staff to come back with a report on what qualifies for consent. <laughs> and the second thing is any new additions or new reports are somehow highlighted or earmarked so that we're aware of them. Even when they're put into the agenda, we can see them easily. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, I thought yeah. it was stop the consent agenda oh, yeah. until that. that was, I, I meant it, uh, to, just not to do it until we come back with the criteria. No consent agenda. No just consent don't agenda. Okay, well then, why don't we separate the two? Okay, so this way, because some people are speaking the other way, so you don't want both to go, go the wrong way if it doesn't. So why don't we do the first one, uh, I think which we all agree, any new additions? to the council agenda are highlighted, somehow earmarked uh, in a real obvious manner in the in the agenda, is that right? As additions. At, right, exactly, as an addition, as a new part, as <coughs> however, right. Or under the heading, heading additions, I gotcha. Right, okay, in an obvious way. Okay, uh, and who made that, who made that vote? That was, that was Councillor uh, Cario yes, and uh, Morocco. Okay, we'll call that vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. <coughs> <clears throat> and the second part, you're asking for the motion to be that consent agendas cease until we get the report? Until we get the report back on the criteria of what makes the consent agenda. Okay, so I wonder. Right, the, the, excuse me, but the explanation that was given by the Atkins City Clerk was really kind of gray and kind of weak. And so I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe it's a tender, it depends on who. It really was weak. So if, if we know what we can look for in the consent agenda, as Mr. Todd said, if it's tenders and things like that, that's fine. I just ask for the big criteria, the criteria. So we know what's in there, <coughs> what can be in there, what can't be in there. And if Councilor Crater is uncomfortable with the consent agenda, there's only a few things that, oh, maybe another meeting before, before we get the report. So don't put anything in the consent agenda next week. Have the report come back next week, and the following week it can go back to the consent agenda. Uh, Councilor Craig? So, um, I'm, that's exactly what it is. No, I'm going to give you the simplest example. Guy called me up and said, Kim, can you explain to me what's in the consent agenda? And he said, can you email over to me the criteria, which is what you're talking about? I said, I don't have, we don't have it. We just know, and once in a while our staff stand up and say something about it, but I said, that's all I can tell you is when they think things aren't contentious or there's no big deal about them or they're all straightforward. So I had nothing to send to the guy except that 
this is what they think up there. And he mentioned a couple of things that he thought when he was watching, that he thought, well, I thought there should be some discussion about them. And that's when he said to me, what's the criteria? And that's when I said, I don't have one. We don't have one. And I realized that's pretty naive that we don't have a criteria. We just put them in there. So what we're proposing is pretty simple. We'll have a criteria, we'll make we follow it. And if somebody watching or is here and says, why isn't it? Then we'll say it's because it's the criteria has been met or it hasn't been met. But I'm going to tell you the biggest problem was that, I'm just going to say it, that last one, when you're imposing a tax, I don't care what the tax is, that it just got put on the consent agenda. Even I can't figure that out. Who the heck said put it on the consent agenda and we're going to go out and impose a tax on businesses? We're going to impose a tax on businesses without having a discussion. I don't care what businesses. It could be the Avondale store. It could be uh, the small businesses. Can you imagine what they would be saying if we went and said, good news for you out there, we're imposing a tax on you because we can do it, but we're not going to have any discussion with you and we put it in the consent agenda. I mean, my goodness. And that's what really irritated me more than anything. And some of us, I don't know, not some of us, me, I kind of thought, well, that's a backdoor way of doing it. Why would you do it that way? Something as significant as that. And we've been pressing the provincial government. I gave it a shot. Couldn't come up with a solution, but they came up with something that they're proposing. Doesn't mean we have to do it, but they're proposing something, and we put it on the consent agenda and with 12 other items. I think that was one of the biggest consent agendas I've seen, and you just put up your hand and put say yes. It wasn't only because a couple of us brought it up and said, we better talk about this, that it got. And then uh, on top of all of that, the ironic thing is the motion gets passed, and I'm going to take the responsibility. I didn't make that motion. I made a pretty simple motion, and the motion was that we go out to the stakeholders, we have meetings with them, and it comes back to this council, we make a decision. But somehow I missed the fact that the CAO or yourself, whoever, said let's approve it in principle, which I can tell you my phone rang off the wall saying, how could you approve it in principle when you haven't even come out to talk to us? That's not fair. And then we brought it back here. We tried to get it changed. And then we brought it up again tonight because when we tried it a second time, it still gets you. You can shake your head, Mr. Mayor, and play with your iPad. I know you don't want to hear this unless I'm saying good things. And what are you going to do? You're going to sue me? You're going to take me to court? You know, what is that what you're going to do? I'm just telling you. Counselor, people, I'm going to ask you to, so I'm going to ask you to, so would you please remove that comment? Which one do you want removed? Am I going to sue you? Is that what you're saying? Am no, I going to sue you? No, you won't sue me, no. Well, no, well no, why would you say something like that? I, you know, I had my because opening. Because I'm frustrated. Well, you've been around the block long enough. This shouldn't frustrate you. Come on. I, I, I just started okay. about so starting I, I do, the year I off take it back. in a positive. Thank you. I take it back. But come on now. I take it back. Is that enough? I take it back. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So that's what irritated. And, and when the phone call started coming in, because what happened was. Let's address the motion. Okay. Yeah, Please. you're right. You're right. Please. You're right. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne. So, uh, and before you run away, Mr. Solicitor, uh, the solicitor had suggested uh, we are coming forward with a new procedural bylaw, yes, and in that, you thought this could be incorporated, well, the new... Would, uh, would just, I thought it would uh, expedite things to address uh, Councillor Cario's concern because we're already working on the procedural bylaw, and the work's already underway, so we would just incorporate that into the report that we're already uh, providing uh, with the uh, proviso that there would not be a consent agenda until we reported back with the criteria if that's acceptable to council, that's what we do. And that way, you know, we just keep moving along with something that the council's already put underway. Councilor Aynor. Can, can he just explain, clarify the procedural bylaw? So is it how, how things take place within this chamber? Then I would like them to also add that staff should not be suggesting changes to our motion. It is that eight of us who are making motions. We are not stupid people. We know what our motions are going to be. That whole situation could have been adverted if the motion was left as was and wasn't changed by the recommendation of a staff member. Well, so, but, but Jim, we're not stupid people. We know what motions we want to put on the floor. So I don't think they should be amended by any member of staff. We're the ones elected to make the decisions here. Well, right now we're not dealing with procedural bylaw. I just, just referenced asked. that. But my comment would be that we ask staff all the time. They're here to help us through the situation. In a lot of ways, they're the experts, not us. And we're here to make the government 
kind of political decisions and we asked the experts, the legal expert, the fire expert, the, the financial experts, all the different experts. So we're gonna ask for their advice. So when would we ever not have them give us professional advice? The advice, so the, the instance for speaking of the advice had been asked. The conversation had taken place. I watched it this afternoon when, just before I came in. Councillor Crater made his motion and Mr. Todd leaned over and said to you, in principle, pending meeting with the resident, meeting with the stakeholders. That's not what he said. He knew his motion, the, the conversation took place at length before that. So there should be no, that, that wasn't uninformed. You had such a long debate on that. Don't amend our emotions, our emotions once it's made because then we get right back into this, this kind of adversarial type atmosphere and we're the ones elected here to make the decisions. And I understand going to the experts, but that had already been done. We don't need addendums made to our motions by staff. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the original motion and the motion uh, is, the motion is on the consent agenda that stuff, staff come back with a report on uh, criteria to be on the consent agenda, and then they're not being a, a consent agenda at the next council meeting until we have this criteria. Yes. That's the motion. Yes, sir. Does everyone understand that? Say, if I can, I thought we voted on the staff coming back with the criteria, and you asked to have the motion about the consent agenda at the next meeting as a separate motion. Am I correct? No, the first part of the uh, was the uh, new additions being highlighted under new additions. And under the also, yeah, I'd like it separated also. Well, we did separate it. We already voted on the first part. Mm -hmm. So now we're voting on this, the consent agenda part. You, I know, but you're saying cut it out. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. I said, I don't Okay. Okay, so it's been request to separate the second part. So first third we'll... Part. The, the, yeah, second and third part. So first, can we please vote on the consent uh, agenda <coughs> coming back, I'm sorry, criteria for the con consent agenda coming back to council. Is that right? Yeah. Is that, okay. So we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. And the last part is not having a consent agenda. That's what we're voting on until we have until, criteria. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a relevant, it's really kind of, point because all we're going to do then is say pull everything out of the consent agenda and go for the one by one. So you do it the one, but that's fine. Okay. So the vote or the motion is to not have a consent agenda until council deals with the report. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, so that passes. Okay. Now on to the consent agenda, which we still have. <laughs> Uh, which uh, council, what's council's will? Okay, moved by Councilor Morocco, seconded by Councilor Campbell that we approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, are there any communications? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just the, no, nothing additional. Just the two listed there. Okay, so um, let me just call them up here. Uh, so what's our, uh, I'm sorry, I got a. Help me out here, Mr. Clerk, uh, on what we've got here for uh, the clerk bylaw. Yeah, the, the first, communi first communication is just a memo from myself, just explaining the reasoning for uh, bylaw 2018-1. One, really just that the, the original bylaw passed in 2010 just named the, the position or job title as being the acting clerk. And that's, that's quite common, it's usually done um, just in case there is a change in position, whereas if there was a new manager of clerk services at any time, uh, that person could have filled in as the acting clerk. Uh, there are some requirements, uh, mainly through the Office of the Registrar General, uh, under the Vital Statistics Act for, for example, um, uh, marriage licensing and uh, burial certificates, uh, or deaths that uh, there needs to be a clerk or an acting clerk or a deputy clerk in place and they're they're suggesting to us that uh, there actually has to be a name 
uh, a portion to that bylaw. So that's why that bylaw exists. So, so we don't need to make any kind of motion. It's going to be in the bylaws. The uh, the memo is just for council's information. Okay. So uh, a motion to receive the memo from the acting clerk. <coughs> Moved by Councilor Morocco, seconded by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved. And then we've got a letter from Minister Souza. Uh, and that letter is, uh, where are we here? In regard to the cannabis uh, being available for retail distribution in the communities. So we, okay, mo motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Morocco that we receive the letter. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Uh, we've already done the mayor's report and announcements. Uh, now we're into the bylaws. I already did it. Motion by Councillor Thompson to give a bylaws uh, first uh, reading. Move second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Bylaws 2018-1 through 2018-3, read a first time. Okay, and Councillor Thompson, uh, a motion to give the bylaws a second and third reading. Seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Bylaws 2018-1 through 2018-3, read a second, third time and passed. New business. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yesterday, Loblaws came out with the information with respect to their $25 gift certificate they're, that they're offering up as a, as a way of uh, admitting guilt to price mm -hmm. fixing. And uh, I'm encouraging everyone in the city of Niagara Falls that has an email address to apply for that $25 gift certificate and in turn to use those certificates to give them to Project Share or uh, the food bank uh, as a way of helping them help the people that are really in need in our community. And if, if you do the math, if 10,000 people went out and, and got a card, that's $250,000. Awesome. Right? So uh, I, I can't make a motion on that, but I hope the message gets out there that uh, each and every one of us that's got an email address, please go to, uh, it's loblacard.ca, info at loblacard.ca. So why don't you make the motion that council uh, encourage uh, residents to, to get their um, $25 credit and donate it to the local food bank or, or a soup kitchen. Yeah, I, I would make that motion in your worship. Okay, uh, here, here. moved by Councillor Campbell, second by, yeah? No, conflict. Oh, a conflict? It's a bit of stuff. <laughs> what happened? He's got a conflict. Okay, conflict by Councillor Thompson. Uh, Always good stuff. Seconded by Councillor Crater. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's Yannette. Were you scratching your head? Or was it? Okay, that's... Uh, Councillor Morocco. Right. Thank you, that was good. Um, just on a new business, I know that uh, it's a new year and we're looking forward to uh, catching up and seeing where we're at. And as we get into our final year of our uh, term, I know that we've actually asked for a number of reports uh, even over the last year. I know that we keep going back and looking for reports and sometimes you just kind of forget about the reports that you've asked or that you're waiting for. Is it possible that we could actually have an update on some of the reports that we're um, so far, you know, that we're looking for as of today from the last while? I know there was one on fire. I think we talked a couple of times on different other issues that we're still waiting for. So if we can have a report back on the reports that we're looking for <laughs> and where they are, the status would be great. We've made this motion many times. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. And it's well, not might just... Might as well start the new year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Get a report for all the uh, all the reports that we're looking for. Yeah, it was back. status. Yeah, status. Okay, so motion by Councillor Morocco, second by Councillor Campbell, that uh, counts, or that staff give council an update, a report on the status of reports, reports and motions that we've made in the past. Is that right? Exactly, where we are. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Councillor Thompson? Yes, um, I had a call from your office during the week and uh, uh, was asked about the uh, rodent problem. 
uh, within the city, rats specifically, and uh, there is still a fairly serious problem with a couple of uh, uh, areas and individuals. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I uh, live in the north end in a nice uh, townhouse uh, project and uh, looking out in the backyard in the middle of the afternoon, uh, my wife said to me, look at that. And there was a rat running across uh, the backyard. Uh, never seen one before. I put out traps and in two days caught three rats. Uh, so there is still a serious problem uh, throughout the city and uh, the reason they called me from your office was because of my involvement with the health department who used to look after this problem and maybe we wouldn't be where we are if they continued their uh, uh, their access to looking after this problem uh, like they used to in years gone by. They'd go to a whole neighborhood, every yard, determine where they were and to direct what's going on. It got so bad uh, many years ago uh, when I was involved here that uh, we had to actually hire uh, a, an exterminator who would go into private properties to try to get it under control. And we did that for several years. We had a budget item uh, in the uh, 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 operational budget and we got it all under control. I think that uh, we still have a uh, serious problem. I know they've been baiting the sewers, but what I would like to do is, uh, because the question was asked to me, uh, to have uh, an updated report on the status of the number of complaints and to determine uh, if we are at the position where we should have uh, Twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars. I think we had uh, previously in the annual budget uh, to respond to uh, situations like this uh, because it's continuing on. So I would uh, ask that we uh, have a report back so we can make some decisions with respect to the rodent population in the city. Okay, we got a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Crater, that the staff report back. Um, on with the status of the rodent uh, problem that we've had in the city and how we're dealing with it. Uh, Councilor Tom, uh, uh, Crater? Um, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, Councilor Thompson has spoken. I was gonna speak on it too. Um, and I had a, a number of calls. I contacted a couple of exterminators because <coughs> I was curious, because it's winter. Like it's winter, how can you have rats? That's what I'm thinking, how can you have rats in the winter? And they were saying, as Councilor has mentioned, it's one of the worst years that we've had. And so there's even now we, we're having, and they're telling me that because you see rats now, then you can expect <coughs> next year, it's gonna be even worse than we've had this year. So um, I'm just gonna close with saying that, like we actually need to have an action plan of all things. We need an action plan now. We have to have something in place to deal with the rats. The way we were going about it is, you know, we get the calls, and many of us go out and we try to figure out, and our staff try to figure out what to do. And it's like it's hit or miss. And they're suggesting you actually have a plan in place so that you map the areas out when you get the calls, you know where they're coming from. You look at the areas adjacent to them, see what has. Anyways, you have something throughout the city where you have, a, and you can follow what you need to do and what, and what can resolve the problem. They're suggesting to me that if we don't have something in place, that we could have even a more serious problem next year. And I think Councillor Thompson mentioned it. I remember him saying, because of his experience with the health department, that, that we should be looking at, maybe maybe we should be looking at having one one provider, maybe even an RFP. I don't know if that, what his thoughts would be, but that's what I think. So that it's done by one, there's records kept, there's a, you know, this is a serious thing when it, you know, when it comes to rats. And it's, I went out to a couple places they called me and it went out. And, yeah, he's right. There they were. Even I'm shocked. This is winter. I'm freezing. Uh, how are they able to manage? They do, and they're up. They're into our. They're into our sewer systems and are floating around. They're moving around. So I'm going to second the motion. I only want to speak on it because that's how serious it is. Even now in the winter time, and 
and then we need to have an action plan. So I second the motion and please to do that. Yeah. So um, uh, we could call for uh, uh, proposals uh, on the cost of doing this, and you could even put that on the consent agenda. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, call the motion. Does everybody understand the motion? So we're going to ask, yes, uh, Councilor Peter Angel? The, the motion is that we have a report back from staff on the rat rodent problem within the city and uh, on how we're going to deal with it going forward. The rat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Um, I, I didn't mention that uh, I also have a uh, rabbit in my backyard. It's totally fenced. I don't know how he got in there. And uh, I've, he's eating all the bark off my shrubs. Uh, I put a, went and bought a cage, uh, very sophisticated. Put a big uh, um, carrot in the back. He hasn't touched it once. <laughs> he's been all around it, won't go in. <laughs> anyway, another problem I have. Anyway, uh, everybody got uh, this correspondence uh, from Ian O'Connor regarding his uh, uncle, uh, Dan O'Connor, who started uh, soccer. soccer in the city of Niagara Falls, uh, put in a tremendous amount of time and effort and made it all happen. Um, started in May of 19. 59 and uh, got all kinds of sponsors and helped out and uh, everybody uh, um, I think got a copy of this uh, did they not no, no, no. well anyway the, there's a picture of uh, uh, I haven't changed a bit in 1959 look at that <laughs> uh, it looks like I'm sitting there anyway um, I would like to uh, refer this letter, all they're suggesting. And he was in our uh, uh, wall of fame in the past for his involvement. And they have said, uh, with your changes in your parks, your upgrading, uh, they would like his name put on the list with the other uh, uh, appropriate people to be considered for naming of the park. Started soccer in our community. So okay. move. Okay. Second. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Crater that we forward the name, the, what was the name, O'Connor, the first name was John, was it? Yeah. Dan. Dan. Dan O'Connor to, uh, to the list for possible future recreational naming. Okay, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Any other new business? Adjournment? No, new oh, new business, I'm sorry, Councillor Carrier. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> because we're in our, our last year, I've had something on my mind, and I've mentioned it to a few of the other councillors, and uh, it came to light some time back when uh, uh, it had something to do with the clerk, and the CEO had to come to us or had asked us something about there was something that the clerk, uh, the CEO had to do to get our permission to deal with a position. So having, after having spoke with some of my fellow councillors, we used to have a situation where all of the senior directors, all of the senior directors, you, either they were if they were hired or fired or they uh, we were replacing them or creating a new position, it would uh, have to come to council for approval. Um, somehow, I don't know what happened to that, but that went away. And because we're in our last year, because some of us, and no disrespect for Mr. Tabat, maybe in his last few years, uh, knowing that his contract is uh, coming closer to an end than it is to a start. I think I'd like to see that, us go back to that, where the senior directors, any of the senior directors that are hired, fired, whatever, has to be approved by <coughs> council prior to anything being done with their position. I, I'd like to hear what some of the other councilors have to say, but I'd like to put a motion on the floor that we go back to that we used to have a, a GER committee, or a governance committee, that used to meet. Uh, I remember we, the last time we used the governance committee was when we hired Mr. Todd. Um, but I'd like to see maybe even the governance committee be put back together. And when we get to the, the position where we're gonna replace a person or hire a new person, or someone's uh, leaving us for whatever reason, 
it would maybe go through the new the governance committee or not but council would have the final say on a hiring or a dismissing of one of the senior staff and i'd like to make that a motion okay we got a motion by councillor thompson uh, Carrio. that's thompson. Our, i'm sorry councillor Carrio. Councilor thompson is um, are you, t you you're talking about department heads yes you not? See, yes department heads uh, well, yes. senior, uh, senior senior staff, directors. Uh, I'm sorry, senior directors. Uh, I think I think if you're talking about department heads, yes, yes. I think that's the way it used to be. Yes, years ago, a uh, uh, department head would go to the council for yes. final approval. Yes, uh, all the work would be done in house by the CAO or HR, but uh, the council department heads. Yes, sir. So that's what you're, you're talking right. about. I don't have a problem with that. It's the way it used to be. So I'll second. Uh, discussion of council? Councilor Crater? So I will, uh, I'm more than pleased to support. I think the other thing and is, I think it's going to be cautious what I say, but you let somebody go and you don't even know why. I've never seen that. I've never seen where you let somebody go, but you don't know why. Just know that someone tells you that they should be gone, and that's kind of it. You're talking about a person's career, you're talking about a person's future, you're talking about a person's livelihood, and you can't figure that out. And every day this, that every day I get up thinking, I can't believe this has happened. So I totally agree that should come to the council, and you know, then, then we collectively make a decision. I know how, how would we feel if somebody just let you go and you didn't know why. I, that's how I try to measure things. What if I was in that position? So I totally agree with what's being proposed. I think it's the right thing to do. Any other discussion of council? Any feedback from staff? HR, no? Okay, well if there's no further comments, then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Any other new business? Councilor Pierangelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I was hoping to get a report back on uh, the status of bike lanes in the city. Uh, I know a couple years ago, um, we uh, did a pilot project where we looked at Victoria Avenue uh, and said that it's wide enough that it could accommodate parking and a bike lane and the traffic that we have. Um, I, I, I'd like to know whether or not First of all, that's going to be expanded. The second thing that I'd like to know is um, roads that the region is planning on redoing, perhaps over the next five year plan. Because I want to, I can't stress the importance of having the region put bike lanes on the roads that they're reconstructing. <coughs> and um, I know every day, because I work on McLeod Road, um, I, I get off the highway there and then I have to take a right. And I notice that the region is is reconstructing that road up to the actual bridge. It seems to me like the bike lane is disappearing. Um, the city the city has gone ahead and they've put a bike lane in on Keeler Road from Lundy's Lane all the way down to McLeod. And then a couple of years later, we extended that bike lane from Keeler on McLeod all the way down to Oakdale. It would be great to see uh, some connectivity. Connectivity is very important. Um, we can't continue to force bikes on the sidewalk. It's not safe for the riders of the bikes, especially if it's curved-based sidewalks, and it's not fit, and it's not safe for the pedestrians that are on the sidewalk. So, if I could just simply have a report on the status of bike lanes and where we see it going in the future, whether or not we'll be adding to any of the existing routes that we have, whether or not we'll be achieving some connectivity within the city. I think I talked before about actually getting um, a square or a rectangle first of all and then perhaps we can build from that and that would be one regional road or uh, one on each side north south and one east west as well so that we can <coughs> form a square or a rectangle in the city and then perhaps we can add from there. So now will this I'm just curious is this now you're talking regional as well the north, most of the north, south, east, west are regional roads. So, um, is that who is that? Is that Mr. Holman or that's pardon me, Carl? Oh, Mr. Dren. 
So Mr. Dren? Sorry, I have a comment on the first uh, report yeah. on Victoria Avenue. There is a follow-up report coming. Okay. It will come in the next couple of meetings. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. As far as the second one, I know the reconstruction that's taking place on McLeod Road is not the region, it's it's the ministry. Uh, okay. Right. So they're reconstructing the portion over between Oakwood and that's that's the ministry that's that's doing that project. They don't put in bike lanes? Um, I, can, I can verify whether they, they are or not. Um, Okay. So I, I can check check on that issue. Okay. Uh, Your Worship, I'd still like to know as well um, the next five-year plan for the region and whether or not we can see a future for bike lanes, uh, or whether we have to bring it up as an issue. So do you want to? So the, so your motion now mm -hmm. will be just so you can refine it. Can you just repeat it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think Mr. Dren said that he was already going to be coming back with the yep. report Victoria. on expanding the pilot project that we did here in the city which is using our own roads to add some bike lanes. So I guess my motion would be that staff report back on any future works that the region is proposing for road reconstruction and whether or not um, bike lanes would be included in those. And if we can just kind of get an idea of what those roads would be. Again, I, I, I think our goal at first would be to create some type of uh, rectangle or some type of square so that at least we can allow people to travel and then from there we can have offshoots. Okay, so that's the motion. We have a second by Councillor Campbell. No just further discussion, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just have one thing. Um, a while back, uh, three or four meetings ago, um, the library board came up uh, quite a board member and that was because we had uh, got a little further removed council I and only off their board because of the Ducks Bear report. Um, I remember at that time thinking to myself that we had gone way too far. And, and, and that was not what his report was recommending. And yet we went ahead and removed her off the library board and the uh, Niagara Falls Hydro Holding Board. So I made the motion at that time that we should reinstate her back to the library. I thought that was the right thing to do. I just want to thank council for supporting that motion to uh, reinstate her. Um, since then, I've been <coughs> thinking this, that we had gone too far. Um, and I was the one who did vote in favor of it, but we had gone too far with what we had <coughs> above the Duxbury report and penalizing for something. I still don't believe that she did anything wrong. But having said all that, I'm going to make a motion that we reinstate uh, Councilor Ioni back to the Niagara Falls Hydro Holding Company uh, retroactively. In other words, that she, in, in essence, that she was never removed in the first place and that she be made whole for anything that uh, she may have lost because of us removing her from that board. So I'm making that motion. Do we have a second? Second that motion, Worship. I have a call. Do we uh, have any discussion of council? Councilor Campbell? Just a, a quick question. Um, are, is there any ongoing investigations happening right now that could impact upon our decisions sometime today or in the future? Mr. There are going, ongoing investigations, but I don't think the council should look upon the two things as being connected. Um, this is Councillor uh, Crater's motion relates to the situation okay. now and what happened in the past. What have uh, future findings should not be used to evaluate okay. the actions of yeah. uh, that uh, Thank you. are being proposed here today. Any other discussions of council? Okay, well, we'll call the vote. Recorded. Uh, Council's heard the motion. Councilor Campbell? Against. Councilor Crater? In favor. Councilor Curio? In favor. Councilor Morocco? Against. Councilor Peter Angelo? Councillor Strange is absent. Councillor Thompson? Yes. Mayor Diodati? Opposed. 
It passes. Any other new business? Yeah. Councilor? First of all, I want to say thank you to Council. Second, I'd like to make a motion that we follow the St. Catharines City Council's resolution at its meeting on December 18th and that the City of Niagara Falls respectfully requests that the Premier of Ontario immediately appoint a supervisor to take over the operations of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority and that the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, all Niagara municipalities, all <coughs> Niagara MPPs, the City of Hamilton, Haldeman County, Minister McGarry of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Auditor General and the Ombudsman be notified of this motion. I so move. Do you have a seconder? No, okay. Do we have any uh, discussion to the motion? I've got Councillor Crater and Councillor Thompson. Uh, I'm pleased to second the motion. Uh, for those who are watching and may not understand what's happened, you had an individual who's a veteran <laughs> who expressed concerns over an agency called the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, expressed concerns over things that he felt were not going on. Just like sometimes people express concerns about what we do. And that agency then decided they were gonna, they sued him, took him to court. Now remember, this is a veteran who fought for our rights for freedom of speech, a veteran. That board of all things, the conservation board, is made up, majority are elected officials. At one time, that board was made up more of public appointees, uh, a bit like the, the Niagara Parks Commission, but they took everybody off of it and put on elected officials. So those elected officials made the decision that we're gonna sue this guy. And how they're gonna do it is we're gonna use taxpayers' money to sue. We're not putting our money in as board of directors to cover the costs. We're gonna sue this person. It went to court and the judge, I don't know if you've seen the ruling, but the thing that jumped out at me, and that's why I'm so upset, he said, I cannot believe in my dominion of Canada that a government agency would go after an individual who's expressing their views about what they feel is inappropriate with the uh, running of the agency. In the end, the judge ruled that not only he ruled wasn't guilty of anything, but he ruled that the Niagara Conservation Authority had to repay Ed Smith's legal cost. That's $131,000 of taxpayers' money that they have to pay. Now, there's been questions asked of the Conservation Authority, how much did you spend to take him to court? You know what their answer is, the Conservation Authority? We're not telling you. You don't have a right to know how much of taxpayers' money we're spending. We're not going to tell you. Now, Ed Smith, this is what he has done. And it shows you what kind of a veteran he is. He had a countersuit in for $60,000 in damages. And what does he do? He says, I'm not proceeding with that, even though I have won. Because I know that if I'm successful, and I believe he would be, that the $60,000 is going to come from the taxpayers. <coughs> I'm not going to have the taxpayers pay me $60,000. I'll drop it. So he's dropped it. it I'm telling you all this because it reinforces that there is definitely a need for the government of Ontario and for the Premier. And on top of that, you've got, of course, the two NDP members of Parliament who are supporting this. You've got Jim Bradley, who's the Liberal Member of Parliament, supporting this. You've got the Provincial Member of Parliament for the Conservative Party who is supporting this. So you've got bipartisan support that there needs to be an invest a supervisor brought in. So I'm really proud to support this when you think that our taxpayers' money has been used to attack and sue an individual <coughs> that he had the courage to stand up and put up $130,000 <coughs> to defend himself and the court has ruled in his favor. And the big matters, what just astounds me is uh, at least Bruce Timms, who was a former chair of the Niagara Falls Conservation Authority, I read his comments. He said, "We need to learn from this. You know, I'm going to step step aside." And they made a decision, but then you read <coughs> the public relations report by, by the Conservation Authority. What did they say? Now, now 
the judge is out to lunch. We stand by our, where we, you know, we stand on the facts. We're wonderful. We're a great organization. And so they're not even prepared to acknowledge that, that they did something that was wrong. The courts ruled against it. Just accept it. And we're going to tell you how much money we spent all together. I'm going to guess that the Conservation Authority spent of taxpayers' money, not their own money, of taxpayer money, I'm going to, fix, going to take a guess they spent three or four hundred thousand dollars. They can correct me if I'm wrong by just telling us how much there is. And I know there will be another motion because there's support demanding that they release how much money of taxpayers' money they spent. So I'm just telling you this, it's just hard for me to believe in this day and age you can have an agency made up of elected officials. I mean, these are elected officials. They're like us, just like us. And we took taxpayers' <coughs> money, potentially three or four hundred thousand dollars, and sued a veteran who fought for the rights of us to have freedom of speech and said, you don't have that right, because we don't like what you're saying. And the judge rules in his favor. So I'm pleased to second the motion. Thank you. I second the motion. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I get Do we have any other uh, questions or comments? Because I'd like to make some comments as well. Yes, Councilor Thompson. Yeah, well, everybody's been following this through the uh, media for how long now? And uh, I don't know uh, whether uh, we have the authority or uh, we should be sending a, a supervisor in there to run the organization. Uh, they have uh, the ability, the premier, to send uh, auditors in there to do uh, uh, examination. And, uh, you know, we're uh, here as uh, public officials and uh, we're subjected to uh, uh, Facebook comments and uh, people uh, making comments which were, are totally inappropriate in some times. Uh, I've had a few of them uh, where they were left up for several days where they said, too bad uh, Peter Angelo didn't hit him a few more times with the cane. And they leave it there. And, and it's happened a couple of times here. And uh, you have to be able to protect yourself. And if it doesn't matter what citizen, citizen it is, if they're making derogatory comments, uh, you have to have the right and the freedom to do what you have to do. This is usually a, a certainly not a council situation, but an individual situation. But, I don't know enough about what's going on up there and the details. I know a lot of people think they do, but uh, I, have, uh, I have some concerns about uh, giving direction to uh, the government. The government should be able to act on their own without uh, uh, us telling them what to do. So I don't, I'm not going to <coughs> if there's no further comments. <coughs> A few things just to maybe enlighten council and bring you up. I mean, you've heard uh, one perspective which had some fact and some things that were incorrect. Uh, first thing, uh, regarding the supervisor, at the provincial level, it was Bill 139 that was passed without amendments. There was an amendment made by uh, Cindy Forrester, the uh, NDP rep in Welland, who was uh, asking that the supervisor be brought in. That amendment failed. So Bill 139 was passed by all the four MPPs of the Niagara region without allowing the superv supervisor. The whole court case, it was, I know it was simplified in a, in a version you just heard. What happened was there were false statements made by this individual. It doesn't matter if he's a veteran or not a veteran. You, you still obey the law like everybody else. And he made false statements based on a forged document. That's the facts. So what's the message? That we just sit back and allow people to, to spread mistruths? So, and it was about some of our employees at the NPCA. And as a board member at the NPCA, we took action based on legal advice. We didn't just figure out some idea, some big plan in the board. We got legal advice. And we were told that this was the right path for us to pursue to rectify what had been done and said. Further to that, we just had a report done here by Todd McDonald of Performance Concepts. He's the president. He did the 
the initial assessment in 2012 and 2013 of the organization. They called it an organization in crisis. These findings showed a lot of problems at the Conservation Authority. Now he did a follow-up report just this past year in 2017. And he was very critical the first one. He, we jump ahead a few years and he said that was then, this is now. The NPCA reveals a, com a competently managed organization poised to tackle significant policy issues, refine its core mandate, and improve its two-way stakeholder communications. He goes on to say a number of different things. He says that they had consulting with several months of internal external consultation with NPCA stakeholders, including conservation groups, community members, developers, consultants, farmers, volunteers, and park users. So the Conservation Authority has come a long way. And the other thing that you left out, uh, Councillor Crater, was just last week that the Conservation Authority won an appeal to the City of Hamilton that will save the taxpayers $1.6 million in levy adjustment and another half a million a year going forward. And the last part, you know, you suggested, you know, how much the legal bill would be. I'm not sure how you came up with that number, but I can tell you that we have had our own discussions. We're waiting for a board meeting. They don't have the final bill. That's why they can't produce something that doesn't exist. And what their plan is, Councillor, is our plan as a board and my vote will be to release the numbers because I don't think there should be any hidden numbers. The numbers are the numbers. So that's going to be my vote and I've made that clear. I've already communicated that to the chair. I said I'd like to see the numbers released and they said it's got to be a board decision. I don't have the authority. So no one's trying to hide anything. It's a well-run organization. There's been a lot of nonsense over the past year, most of it political. But I can tell you right now, no one takes this lightly and absolutely, I think in the end, the sad part, the taxpayer was the loser because they're gonna be the ones that foot, foot this bill because of false statements based on a forged document. And the judge, his actual quotes from the case, the fast, facts suggest parts were deliberately misleading. That's from Judge Ramsey. It was reasonable to conclude that an entry was a forgery as opposed to a mistake. Those are from Judge Ramsey. So, and I appreciate the outcome was that political people and organizations should have thick skin. That was the message. You can't sue, you shouldn't sue, and that's fine, fair enough. So lesson learned, and that'll be a lesson for a lot of people, but the frustrating part about this kind of anti-slap legislation is people can say things that they know are not true and they can get away with it because that's the outcome of this and that's what the Conservation Authority and other groups across the, the province are upset about. Does that mean someone can get away with saying whatever they want without any kind of uh, payback, without any kind of anything happening? And that's a frustrating experience. <coughs> Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I do have one question. Is the, uh, the Auditor General currently doing an audit on the MPCA? Yes, thank you for that. I, I meant to mention that. Yes, the Auditor General is, she's already met with the board and she's already started her audit of the, uh, of the uh, NPCA. Oh, I have to withdraw my second motion. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, Councillor Peter Angelo. Your Worship, can you just go over again what you said about the province not passing the amendment? And I guess the reason I want you to go over it is because after I listened to you, this motion is to appoint a supervisor, but the province didn't pass legislation that would allow that? That's right. But this motion is to ask the province? I guess so. Okay. Um, does the motion, because of the legislation, can you explain, um, does it already fail? Well, I'm not an expert in, uh, in this kind of thing. All I know is that Bill 139 amendments uh, calling for a supervisor failed at the provincial level. That's what I know. So, okay. So will the province allow a supervisor to go in? That would be my question. It doesn't appear that way. Does anyone know that answer? I do. You know? Okay. Uh, a couple things. Uh, it's pretty important. So what's happened is there is a bill. You're quite right. Uh, 
uh, Cindy Forrest has, has introduced, she's introduced it into the House as a private member's bill. And she's asking that would the province uh, consider a point, would it give the province the authority to appoint a supervisor? And do I know what a supervisor is? Yeah, I was there when I convinced the Liberal government to bring in a supervisor to investigate our hospital. Lots of you were here, you know the crisis. There was no supervisor and we took a lot of effort and a lot of work by many of you here. That, that's what a supervisor does. And you saw what the supervisor did. And I know you work closely with the supervisor, Kevin Smith. <coughs> if that supervisor hadn't come in, I don't know if we'd have this new hospital now. I kind of doubt it. But that's what a supervisor, so no, the bill hasn't never got through the house yet. She's introduced it private member's bill, and there's a process that has to go through. It hasn't gotten through that process yet. What they're hoping is by having municipalities supporting this resolution as the bill moves forward, then they're able to show that there's support by municipalities who are saying there should be a supervisor appointed. That's the pro, that's what they're hoping to get. And I think it's, um, there's a couple other municipalities have, have are supporting this. So. I, I, I understand why you consider withdrawing it, but I'm just trying to explain to you that it's not quite the way it appears that they just said no. They, but the current legislation doesn't allow for it. That's what Cindy Forrester is trying to change is that legislation. And that's why I feel strongly about it. And I understand what you're saying. There has to be, you know, more importantly, there has to be a mechanism. You can't have agencies that just go out and spend $130,000 of taxpayers' money because they're not. Councillor, can you speak to the that. motion, please? I will. I will. I, I will. You're welcome. Sure. Um, so that's the explanation. Okay. The other, the other thing was, um, and Kathleen Wynn, she was on the uh, uh, CKTB, and she said that if the bill goes through, then she would be prepared to support the uh, appointment of a supervisor if the bill goes through the house. So she says she's prepared to do that, but the current legislation doesn't allow it. So the provincial government, the minister uh, uh, is the minister in charge is saying I don't have the authority, so I, I'm not stepping in. That's her explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anoni. And I just want to point out that I think we're the fifth municipality to put this motion on the table, and all the other four passed it. That's, they have not all passed it. The four that have dealt with it have passed it. There are still more to go forward. Waynefleet did not pass it. Did their mayor speak to it too? Because she's on the board also. I don't know, but you need the facts, right? So. Well, um, thank you for correcting me. But we're the only ones that are standing up here saying, does the province allow it? Fact remains that when Justice Ramsey said that this, he was shocked, and I'm paraphrasing, that in his dominion of Canada, a resident was sued for asking questions. I've read the whole thing, and you can pull excerpt from excerpt. If I'm not mistaken, at some point he says, Mr. Smith makes comments that were wrong in regard to information that was improperly posted online, and he wouldn't have known it was improperly posted online. So pulling it out of context can make it seem any way you want. The, the bottom line is the MPCA is in trouble. Um, I don't... Councillor, speak to the motion, please. I am speaking to the motion. That was the motion You're asking I for a supervisor. Forward. That's so... And we're so. asking... And the, the reason they're asking for a supervisor is exactly, the, is exactly because of Justice Ramsey's decision and the wording in his decision. Because I, what I liked about the decision, Mr. Mayor, is he says a resident should be able to ask questions to an elected public body, which makes me know that I'm allowed to ask questions as an elected member of an elected public body. Yeah, yeah. as long as the information is factual, which it wasn't, it was forged. His was forged? The information he presented was based on forged documents. He won. Yeah, well, did he? He was corrected by Judge Ramsey. Well, I read, you You went from memory, Counselor. I actually read the quotes from Judge Ramsey. So anyway, we've got, we've had the debate. We've had the uh, uh, back and forth. So now uh, we'll ask Counsel. wait, actually you've withdrawn your second. So so who made the motion originally on this one? Uh, Counselor Iannone. Counselor Iannone. So we're gonna need a second? Okay, so Counselor Crater is gonna second it. 
Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, fails. Okay. Any other new business? Okay, motion for adjournment. Councillor Morocco, second by Councillor Campbell. Oh, yes, excuse me, Councillor Peter. I did have one. Yeah, I did have one more item. Um, a couple meetings ago, we dealt with the issue of a Niagara on the Lake resolution that talked about uh, two hatters um, where volunteers wanted to, or full time firefighters wanted to be volunteers as well. Um, we supported the resolution. I think in hindsight, it would have been. Uh, it would have been good had we have had a presentation both by our own staff from our HR department and also from the firefighters themselves. I would like to get their perspective on why they oppose it. Now, I, I don't know, I mean, in the resolution that was, or in the motion that we made, the motion was to support the resolution. Um, I believe it was at senior staff that the discussion occurred whether or not to attach a $2,000 donation to that motion. Um, it wasn't talked about in this council chamber, but I believe that that was the end result. If the check has not already been sent, I would ask that the check be held until we could actually have the discussion. I would like to know just the position of both the city and of the firefighters, Your Worship. That's all I'm saying. And in hindsight, I wish I would have been able to hear them. So I'll make the motion Second. that at a future meeting, we have the association as well as someone from our HR department give us presentations on what the position is, and then council can go ahead and make a decision. And I would also include in the motion that if the check isn't already sent yet, that it be held until such time that a decision is made. Okay. Second. Any discussion to the motion? Councilor Thompson? Yes. You got the video on the screen? I don't have the video. That can be shown at the meeting. About, about the, the issue? It can be shown it's, at the meeting. It's very clear. I don't know what we're doing here. A bunch of nonsense. Hey, Councilor Morocco? That's not a point. Uh, I ha took it uh, to the point that we had a conversation with the acting uh, fire chief um, to say, is that a problem in our area? And no, it wasn't. It was very clear that it's not a problem in our area. I fully support, I was supporting volunteers. I think that the volunteers are the heart and soul of our community and help us to meet a budget because we couldn't afford <laughs> to pay for all of the fire t volunteer firefighters if we had to replace them with full time. And I thought that, you know, they were basically being attacked for volunteering, not in their community as the video showed, but in a community that where their fathers or whoever had volunteered for years. and. The union was penalizing them for doing that. And to me, I thought, well, wait a minute. If you want to volunteer, that's your business, what you do on your off time. Nobody's going to tell me what to do or what I can't do on my off time if I want to volunteer. So I actually, when I saw the presentation, and I, was, uh, I met the young lady when she did the presentation too, it was very... I, it's just sincere and I felt, how bad was it? Why didn't they just have a conversation? Why do they have to take these firemen that are volunteering and sue them and cost them all this legal expense for something that they're very passionate, something that their father and grandfathers had done for years? And I understand that there's now, you know, we've got the rules and regulations about the time that you work and how many hours you can work and there's a safety issue and then of course there's all the facts about to um, apparatus and breathing and if, you know, now are you going to get cancer on your volunteer uh, fireman uh, um, volunteering and fire uh, duties, uh, you know, or, you know, so how do they justify that? I don't know, but I felt very passionate for these uh, volunteer firemen that were going into other communities to help them volunteer. And I thought, you know, it was a one-time deal that we, and actually, thought when they put this forward that we were actually supporting it and that they were supporting the $2,000 and then when I realized that we were also committing to the $2,000 I thought well you know what if that's the way that council actually had passed it and it, nobody said anything they were all fine with it then what was our small contribution to help this woman who is a volunteer firewoman and other volunteers that are out there struggling I don't know sometimes you know what you just kind of the pendulum goes way too far the other way and I just thought like when when does it come to time that you can't volunteer for something that you're passionate about? 
So I don't know. I know that um, I had one phone call and an email, and then uh, you know, small conversation. Nothing really ever happened uh, uh, after that. So nobody ever followed up. I thought that that was fine with the uh, with the association. But obviously, it is the union putting pressure on volunteers uh, not to go out, or their full time volunteer, <laughs> their full time firemen to go and volunteer. And so. How does that happen in some of these small uh, rural communities where they cannot afford fire services? So therefore, their fire services are gone because the full-time uh, firemen that were coming from other communities to help in their community volunteer are now being told no or being penalized for doing something that generations have done forever. And now, putting the pressure on these communities, these rural communities especially, to say, no, looks like you're going to have to hire full-time firemen. I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's fair. Because I think they're being pressured by the union to have these other areas create full-time jobs. Sorry, but that's the way I feel about it. I don't think that's fair. Thank you. Councillor Iannone. That's why I support it. Thank you. I think that there's two sides of the story. I think you heard one. I think there's a backstory as to why double hatters aren't allowed. I think we need all the information. That's why I support Councilor Peter Angelo's uh, motion to have the fire service come and speak to us about that. I don't think it's as one-sided as the video, and, and the video was heart-wrenching, I get that. But there's a bigger issue, there's a bigger backstory, there's a bigger reason why that our own people have issues with how we do. I'm really surprised we attached a monetary issue to it. I can see even even if you brought it to council and supported it via a resolution, but supporting it with money I really surprised me. But I think we need to have them come and give us the entire picture. Councilor Carrio. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> um, I don't see any harm in having them come and, and speak to us. I mean, we're all about wanting to get all of the information on every topic before we can make an informed decision. I don't mind hearing our firefighters speak. Uh, I'm certainly in favor and a big supporter of our volunteer system, uh, and most everyone around the table is. But if we are as solidly behind our volunteers as we all say we are, how can it hurt to have the firemen come <clears throat> and make their presentation? I don't mind listening to them. Your Worship, I'll support the motion. I'm just saying my point. Yeah, yeah, okay. Any other discussions? <coughs> Motion is to invite the uh, firefighters here. Councillor Pierangelo, did you want to repeat that? Your Worship, um, yeah, as Councillor Cario said, this isn't an issue about volunteers. It's just an issue about hearing both sides. We didn't hear both sides. That's all that, that's all that I want. I'd like to know from our HR department whether or not they support the policy, and then I'd like to know from the association whether or not they support the policy, and from both why or why not. Plain and simple, and then I'll make up my mind. Has the check been sent and cashed? I don't know. We could ask Mr. Uh, Harrison if he knows. He'd have to look. If it, and that's part of Jump in there. Yeah. I, I don't believe it has, only because uh, the, the money was supposed to be sent to AMO, and AMO has yet to set up that fund. Okay. So we've been waiting to hear back from AMO as to whether or not the fund would be set up. Until then, I, I don't believe anything has been sent. So we gave money to a fund that isn't even set up yet? Well, no money's been sent, so no. But did we know that there, there was no fund to send it to? There was actually a resolution from Paul, I think. Not going to leave. We were supporting another <coughs> community's president that were asking for our support. Okay, so we're not sending the money now. Okay. There was a motion by us. Well, there was a motion. You invited the volunteers to speak also? Uh, Councillor Peter Angel, Councillor uh, Thompson's asking for clarification. If they would like to come, why not? Well, wait, you know, exactly. You said you want to hear both sides. Yeah, you worship. You know, as I said, this isn't an issue about volunteers. I, I think we do everything yeah, we yeah. possibly can to support the volunteers, and we would want to continue that. I would just like to know the rationale behind. It. That's all. And we definitely want to do this. Uh, Cautiously, because I know City of St. Catharines no longer has volunteers. Right, they're gone, and uh, we want to make sure we support our volunteers. We have three volunteer stations and three regular stations, and we want to support everybody, but not one at the cost of the other. We have to be cautious of what we do. So the motion then invites 
the, the firefighters, our staff, and volunteers to give their side of, of the double hatter issue. Okay, so we've got the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that passes. That passes. Opposed? Okay, two opposed, okay. Motion for adjournment. Councillor Thompson and second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor?